शंकराय च मयस्कराय च नम शिवाय च शिवतराय च नम स्त्रीय च कूल्याय च नम भार्याय चार्याय च नम प्रतरनाय चोतरनाय च नम आताय चालाढ़ च नम ष्याय च फेन्याय च नम सिकत्याय च प्रवाहाय च शांति 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 Om Shri Sai Ram, offering my reverential pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagwan. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day three of our iCube workshop. I'm thrilled to kick off today's session by introducing our first guest, Shri P. S. Kunaranjan Sir, a philanthropist and an entrepreneur. A proud alumnus of our university, Shri Kunaranjan Sir attended Shri Satya Sai School in Uti and later completed his M. S. C. in Physics in year 2000. Followed by an MBA in year 2002, he has truly embodied the values instilled by this university, which he carried forward by founding the United Care Development Service in June 2009. Prior to establishing UC, Sir served as the head of Micro Insurance Vertical at Basics, a large NGO group. This role focused on assisting individuals facing financial difficulties. He also served as the head of operations for the North Eastern States. Returning to UC, it functions as a philanthropic exchange, a peer-to-peer -peer platform that primarily aims to provide free healthcare delivered by dedicated by by dedicated volunteers. This is also conducted in tandem with other charitable and public health institutions. An initiative undertaken by Sir's company, named Health for All, is a free and open-source hospital information system designed to manage the hospital with its patients. Currently, Health for All is implemented in over 25 hospitals across various states, and has also been adopted by Shri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Medical Sciences as well as Shri Satya Sai organizations. And now, with great pleasure, let's give a warm welcome to Shri P. S. Gunaranjan Sir. एनकरेज यू टू इंटरक्ट एज मच कैन the title of the uh, session is uh, social entrepreneurship so let's look at uh, what's the thought that comes to our mind when we talk about social entrepreneurship you've had over the past two days several sessions that would have outlined to you important aspects of entrepreneurship so what's so different what is unique or what's perhaps not unique about social entrepreneurship from the rest and uh, equally welcome questions from faculty members as well but we should compete students should compete to take most of it anybody what would you what 
comes to your mind when you talk about social entrepreneurship that you think yes Welfare of the society than the profit making. Welfare. The focus is on the solving the problems of the society. Uh, then the uh, the profit motive is the second motive. Okay. So I'll uh, take points that you bring up. So the objective, objective being uh, primary, as you said. First being welfare, and then second being profit. Okay. Can you think of uh, an organization, a regular company where welfare is primary objective? Can you name? Anything comes to your mind? Yes. Hello. Huh? I'm talking about uh, organizations. Okay. So if you look at uh, healthcare organizations, uh, there are a lot of companies that run hospitals, for-profit hospitals. So uh, the service that they deliver is welfare. Am I right? Directly, they're helping uh, your lot of people, uh, save lot of people's lives. Uh, so, can you name some companies? Okay. And any others? Hospitals. So they're providing, and perhaps all your pharmaceutical industry. That's all welfare, right? Did you think of them as uh, social enterprises? You just outlined the entire pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare industry, and uh, even education for that matter. Every company that does education. Somebody was raising hand. Uh, some problems are already existing, sir. Like pe people or government, they just neglect it. Problems are there, but they neglect it. So some people, they feel that this needs to be changed. And they take initiatives on their own to bring out a change. And I feel that is what is a social entrepreneur. OK. Uh, can somebody expand on what he said? So some unique problem that's identified, that's one aspect. I'll bring that as a separate point here. Uh, uh, another aspect is uh, some unique problem of society. Somebody is, so in some way maybe to lend support to his point, healthcare is so many are doing, so there's something else beyond health and education, so somebody wants to look at. So can you cite an example? Uh, you just... Uh, so there's uh, uh, one company called as Bottle & Co. So what they does is they make uh, clothes out of plastic bottles. So that can be one idea of social entrepreneurship. They are uh, like uh, reducing the plastic waste uh, in the country. Okay. That's... So coming back to where welfare is the primary goal, so I did mention the entire pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare industry. So would you define all of it as social entrepreneurs, social enterprises? Huh? Yes. We will not take a final judgment. We are not here to judge. I am just asking for your opinion. Huh? We will not conclude the session to give a badge whether somebody is a social enterprise or not. Huh? I'm trying to uh, weave a discussion uh, to help us expand our understanding of what 
could or could not be social enterprise. What would you say? All of these are social enterprises because they primarily are delivering welfare. Incidentally, maybe ringing in a lot of profits as well. Is that okay? Yes. Which ones? The healthcare, pharmaceutical. Can you name three big healthcare uh, chains and three big pharma uh, companies? Somebody raise hand and yes. Yes. Apollo, okay. Apollo Hospitals, Manipal, uh, Fortis. Okay, three pharma. Huh? One, somebody raise hand and then get up and. Ah, yes. Tripla. Huh? Okay. Okay. Three education related companies. By juice. Any others? Huh? Sorry, sorry. Just let somebody uh, whoever raises hand. Okay. More of recent uh, institutions that are tapping into the remote learning opportunity. Uh, but you may be aware there are a lot of educations which are set up as for profit companies as well. So that's one aspect of it. So but in convention, are these treated as social enterprises? Enterprises? Why? I, I see. Is that a yes or a no? Huh? So, can somebody give you a view? The examples we took, would you take them as social or a regular enterprise? Huh? Regular. Why not social? They are primarily delivering. Okay. Anybody wants to share your view? Why you won't uh, label them as social? Okay, I'll will park. I I, I I won't probe. Uh, I won't push you too much. Uh, the other thing uh, is: Have you heard the word CSR? Is all of us are familiar? So, uh, do you know in what range is uh, the budget of some of the top CSR contributors? In what range? In terms of annual contribution to CSR. We know the rule is 2% of net profit, but what does it amount to for some of the bigger ones? Uh, just some ballpark figure. Hundreds, you can go on adding any number, just come to something, uh, some figure. You can guess, yes, there, I, I see a hand raised there. You want to? Yes? Nobody wants to take a guess? Hundreds, how many, how many hundreds? 5000 crores, which company? Uh, I am doubtful, uh, I, but they are in the range of 1000 to 2000 crores. There are some uh, which are in that range, uh, you know, which is uh, I think one of the biggest uh, CSR budgets which organization has. Huh? Uh, maybe if you add together the Tata group companies, it will amount to that, but by a single company it is, uh, it, I think uh, if I am right, it is Reliance. Yeah. So, would you qualify Reliance social enterprise because more than 1000 crores, even if you put a 100 uh, non-profit social enterprises, it won't amount to that. They are doing the job of uh, more than 100 organizations. It's a social enterprise, right? Huh? <laughs> so, let's not get too worried about definition, but there is what drink what comes to our mind when we say social because even when i pick the names of healthcare industries whose primary product or service is welfare i i don't see consensus that you can call them social enterprise huh? is in terms of balance and it is not by definition but in terms of balance of the value okay 
how much we kind of prioritize uh, welfare. Uh, but why don't we immediately, even though some organization is de delivering healthcare, why don't we qualify it as a social enterprise? Because somewhere there is a concern that even in that service, the objective is very uh, profit oriented. Okay. So, why would you, would you very confidently step into any of these hospitals? Have you, huh? Why? Because you don't know how much you will burn your pocket. <laughs> okay. Whether it will cure your problem or not, one thing guaranteed is it will burn your pocket hard. Huh? Yours, families, and everybody else. Huh? So, again, it's, it's a question of value. Uh, it's not so much your stated definition. Huh? Uh, however, uh, would you call the Tata's, the Tata group also do a lot of uh, CSR? So, would you call them also a social enterprise? Yes? Huh? Yes, no? No, okay. So, again, a mixed view. Okay. Uh, however, it's one of the very old institutions uh, which has been known for philanthropy, uh, the holding. Uh, entity the trusts uh, which receive their income from the group companies uh, much before even the CSR laws were enacted they were a group that was steeped in lot of philanthropy okay and uh, so therefore still if you talk about social contribution social uh, enterprise you uh, make a positive connect with such institutions so what really, if, if, it's, if it's values that we are talking about, is values an important aspect of social enterprise? Huh? Yes. Not just, is it just welfare that would qualify a social enterprise? No. Because there are already, is it only profits? Anyway, the profit as you said is not the primary objective. Okay. So it, it, it the, outcome the welfare is the primary thing and then if you are able to make some revenue that is acceptable. Uh, what about, what are values that you look for in a social enterprise? Anybody to give thoughts? How would you, what are some two, three uh, key indicators that you would uh, attribute to a social enterprise. Huh? Uh -huh. Sir, uh, integrity, compassion and uh, transparency. Okay. So, values, integrity, Compassion, and transparency. Thank you for bringing up these. So, even if we were to do a lot of welfare, whatever other unique problems, if we want to stand out as a social enterprise, it, these are I think important values. Each one of these it, by itself is pregnant with a lot of uh, meaning. Uh, one has to dwell into it, integrity, compassion and transparency. I think very well put. I will uh, like to share some, uh, some of my own thoughts on this journey and uh, and welcome you to continue to interrupt uh, as we go through this uh, interaction. One other name that uh, rings in my mind when we talk about social enterprises, I, I want to make a connect, bo borrow something from the word social media. How is it different from regular media? We are all familiar with social media, right? 
So what sets it apart from the regular uh, established media? Answers? You have to participate. Not seeing much response. Huh? Uh, it's more instantaneous, like more real-time data is available. It's quick. Well, uh, I will say, if you see, there are there are all the traditional media are flashing, uh, breaking news, breaking news. Uh, nobody can get faster. <laughs> there there and the yeah? interaction is also there. Like we have more interaction. Interaction. Oh, they are always the uh, uh, mic. They are all the time interacting. It's a live show these days. <laughs> You see any of the mainstream media, they, they speak, but they are also jutting the mic into random people, uh, taking opinions, views. Uh, you're right in some way, but I'm, I'm trying to push the case a little further. Interaction is fine. Uh, and uh, uh, live, what else sets social media apart? Sorry? Yes. So essentially, if I can expand on what you are putting forth, it's about participation. It is not controlled uh, by a board that sets uh, an agenda for a, a particular media channel. Rather, it is not the narrative is not controlled by any one person. It is a participative thing. Is it, am I right to say that? Social media is essentially, it's not, there's no central organizing force to dictate what should be the point of discussion, view. It's everybody contributing. Of course, in any participative thing, there'll always be louder voices which can drown out others. But nevertheless, as a platform, it, it, it allows by design wider participation. Okay. So I'm trying to borrow that idea of more participative uh, element. Does something like that apply to social enterprise? Did you get my question? How would you translate this aspect of participation, collaboration? Does it apply to a social enterprise? Yeah, somebody responding can, can expand on that. Yes. So let me uh, share my thoughts on this. Another aspect to some three very important uh, points that you brought up on integrity, compassion, transparency is I would also put participation slash collaboration. Uh, often when we think of enterprise, uh, social enterprise, we are talking about social entrepreneurs. So we want a hero always, right? So uh, we, we, every cinema has to have a protagonist, right? Somebody has to be the champion, a hero. Okay. Um, and uh, Superman, who will whack all the baddies in, uh, <laughs> in one scene. And uh, we expect something like that. And we would like to uh, see an image of that in real life. So therefore, we want to see an entrepreneur, we want to see a hero, we, and we all aspire to be that as well. Am I right? Yes? We all want to be superheroes, <laughs> solo, going out there. But a lot of social problems, huh? have you seen any, uh, what I would say, uh, a mirror of what you see in a cinema, you, you must have seen in a lot of cinema, right? One very well-meaning person, sincere person, solving all the problems in, in, in that span of two hours. Have you seen in reality anything like that happen? Huh? Okay. Reality is quite different. Even if you spent your entire life, 24 by 7, trying to address a social problem, yeah? uh, is success guaranteed? No. How, how is it better? Where is the better chance for it to be guaranteed? Sorry? Okay. 
in reality. See, because if you expect one person to lead the charge and deliver or to solve the problems of the world, that's a very risky model, would you say? Is it a risky model? Because you're betting on one. In any business model, you, you would have you know, in the recent days uh, or in your classroom studied that uh, if there's a lot of dependency on one variable, while well, it's easy to control it, uh, you can predict what will come out and all of that, but it's also very risky, right? Standing on one leg is, you, you, you can fumble and fall, okay? So, that's not a great idea. Uh, while it's nice, the contributions can be significant. The other aspect of social, any social activity is the, the principle, the philosophy of collective work. Of course, there's no collective work if there are no committed individuals, okay? You can just have a large audience, right? You can have how many? Lacks of spectators, okay? And nothing gets done. Everybody can keep giving opinions. Eh? That's what a lot of social media is about. But you have very little social action. We have a lot of media that essentially means noise, chatter. Okay. Everybody gives opinions and thoughts. But to translate that into action, yes, even if one individual comes, we have to appreciate. But will that solve the problem? Yeah. So at least somebody is doing that, we have to appreciate. So we, we're not dismissing uh, the value of somebody who is committed and willing to uh, chase a dream, chase a cause uh, and give everything for a cause. But while it's a great thing, we can appreciate and uh, praise and uh, take inspiration. But will that solve the problem? Okay. It's not enough to be martyrs. Is it important to be a martyr or to win the actual battle? Huh? Is, is it important to win the war, win the battle or is it just, okay, I'll go charge, I'll give my life. What's important? Huh? And battles are won by one person or? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, we have to keep in mind that and the bigger the social issue, the bigger, it, it's a battle. While they, they will always be great generals, great soldiers, unless there is a coordinated effort, collaborative effort, we will not win. Yeah, we can sing the glories of fallen soldiers, uh, but we will lose the battle and we will lose the war and we will lose our collective independence. So that's a very important aspect of, because there is a lot of romanticism attached with social, you know. Everybody went that side, this alone, this guy marched alone. And <laughs> Again, we want to make a cinema out of social enterprise. Huh? It's of little consequence. It, it doesn't serve. It, it, we have to appreciate that person, whoever takes that uh, the lonely path. But that uh, don't appreciate for the sake of cinematic uh, excellence. It is of. It would be better if we collaborate. So a very important aspect. I and that's something personally driven me is uh, to be steer, to steer clear of getting it to my head. That wow, ah, so much has been done. And one of the things I like to say is, I, I, it's been several years since I stopped writing anything that I did. Okay, one, I don't write a CV that's gone long back. I never bother to. Sometimes I'm forced to. Like I come for a talk, you know, yeah, there's a mandate. Otherwise, you won't give you a stage <laughs> unless you send something. Okay, I send a note something, but really don't bother much about it. And CV is something. Uh, I forgotten long back, at, but again, I'm not dismissing all of this. It's important for you. You're, you're getting into your first job. You have to write. You have to present yourself. Uh, I also used to have a habit of uh, meticulously documenting what all I did, uh, what to reflect on, uh, how much, how effective I've been, what did I do this month, this year. I, I would have a day-to-day -day record, not writing long paragraphs, just one, two points. And uh, one fine day, I think about 10 years after I, you know, this is after college, I, I just opened that file and pressed delete, hard delete. It's no longer there. Yeah. And uh, just simply that I am now 
I think I'm confident I, I will 100% apply. I will reflect every day. I don't need to reflect on the past, but also to get away that baggage. Here, jo hua, khatam ho gaya. I don't have to rule, reflect. And I actually feel energized, thinking every day is a new day. Every day is a new challenge. You get that spirit when you're getting into something new, you're all charged up, all energy. But after 10 years, if you start going on looking at the back and uh, start reflecting, oh, I've done this, 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 you can just feel good about it and actually not, never <laughs> plan to do anything new. Hmm. That's another big challenge in, uh, in any uh, uh, social enterprise. Okay. At least in for-profit, you want to still be it, you want to stay on top of your net worth because market values keep changing, so I am down, so let me do something, I have to be on top of the world in terms of market value, my profit should be more, my salary should be more. Yeah. But uh, once you've got one award, uh, you're the social entrepreneur, <laughs> oh, I've reached the <laughs> Everest. So, one of the important things is, if we want to be honest, integrity, right? Integrity is about being staying true to the cause <clears throat> is and uh, knowing that there's so much more to be done and uh, knowing that there's a lot more to be done beyond our lifetime. It's accepting. Integrity is also about accepting reality. If we don't accept reality, if we are like ostrich, okay, there's, I have done my work, I have solved the problems of the world, the world is now a, a paradise. Huh? and now I can retire uh, and lord over, then, uh, then somewhere we missed that integrity. So coming back to, I, I'll add one more, is participation or I'll first put collaboration. Okay. Collaboration is a, a very key thing in social enterprise because welfare, achieving welfare, is, is truly collaborative work. If you see, in spite of huge amount of money spent by so many uh, corporates under their CSR, so many other foundations, whether it is family foundations, company foundations, uh, and then, which is the biggest welfare organization, can you tell? You're missing the elephant in the room, like that. This is the biggest welfare organization. Yes. This is the biggest. Hey, don't worry, there is no judgment here. Huh? The shoot answers even if. Uh, don't worry about what your other friends are thinking. <clears throat> but come up with your. Yes. Huh? Yes, it's a very large. I'll say even bigger. Satisai organization is, yes, very big. Huh? Okay, they're still, they're big, I, no doubt, but not the biggest. Huh? Okay, big, not, not the biggest. Huh? UN, okay, big, not the biggest. In our country. Huh? Yeah, can you say it loud? The government. Okay. Is it, is it right? Huh? If the biggest welfare organization is who? The government. Government by? It's of the people, right? By the people, for the people. So the welfare. The government is the biggest welfare organization. But are you happy with it? It's, it's not one or zero. So that's an important aspect we have to keep in life. It is not entirely bad, nor is it entirely delivering what is expected. There are gaps. Just like any organization, you take, if you do a very honest assessment of any organization, there will be still some gaps, but you can also appreciate a lot of good things that are happening. So also, never look at government, you know, we all like to whip somebody, na? The easiest is, this is a very impersonal thing, so whip the government. Ah, government doesn't do this, government doesn't do this. Ah. 
we should not swing in extremes that that is a useless organization or somebody who is part of the government say government does everything <laughs> this is ultimate organization everybody else is a chore only the government so i think an important uh, point to keep in mind is uh, don't get into extremes of because nothing is black and white everything is somewhere uh, shade uh, close to one of these so however if you keep in mind the government is the biggest welfare organization would you want to participate with it yes no should we participate with it or not is it a responsibility to participate with it yes okay that, that seems to be quite unanimous because all of you are can't whether you are donating to other company other uh, trust uh, social organizations or not every day you are contributing to government is it right how are you contributing gst ha huh? every time you buy something in the stores or you go back something ha huh? it's a mandatory donation i call all forms of taxes are mandatory donations okay in addition to mandatory donations once in a while you are little more compassionate you give some voluntary donations okay so csr is again is like a mandatory donation all your taxes are mandatory donations in addition sometimes you are you are giving more than that okay and you are giving what are you giving what are you giving most huh? what can you give sorry yes ha huh? uh what that you are that what is like an evaluation you are not ha uh, you vote, you vote you can vote for anybody each time you are evaluating somebody and they are not performing you can but what is your contribution so vote should never be taken as so to the, uh, that then that's the least day like we are reducing ourselves to the least level of participation i vote ho gaya mera kaam that should not be the thing that is just like mandatory evaluation so that you can uh, switch somebody who uh, to give a you know test somebody else who can do it better what forms of contribution we are doing one is mandatory taxes what else can you do ha huh? sorry yes participate give your time is it right you can give time right it need not always be link to financials contribution in fact i would say that will be more important than financial contribution okay so if we have to make collaborations and also make the biggest organization work better we all have to give time because if that if there is even a 10% improvement in efficiency of the largest welfare organization which we are all part of which is government then there is no need for so many people to struggle and you know, setting up social enterprises and all of that so one of the things the journey i personally had is is to be open to collaborations it is not that yes i can do a lot of things i can uh, write reports of what i have done get more money but and have more independence i, I can do what i want however being open to collaborations being patient to understand and when you work in collaborations what are the first things you have to keep in mind huh? if i am the boss i can give orders okay i can give instructions but if you are working with a collaborator what do you do huh? you can suggest you can persuade you can plan together it's a it's a collab that's the nature of collaboration but so this finger alone can do lot of work yes ha huh? it can do quite a few things right i can put on switches i can move little little things ha huh? but if i have all five i can do much wider range of things somewhere it's a very simplistic uh, explanation you have to experience it in life when they say unity is strength okay 
and I, I, with experience I can tell the kind of what you can achieve as a collaborative effort, you can never do it. Even if I am toiling day and night, putting all my energy with my immediate team that work with me, I can nowhere near achieve what I would have done with collaboration. Yes, one has to have patience. Collaborations are not easy, people, because everybody has a different view of things. Just like here, it's not every. It's easy to get. It's not easy to get everybody say yes to one thing, right? Sometimes the views can be diametrically opposite for valid reasons. Each one has a view. So also different organizations, different individuals will have different views. Just because that view is not consistent with you, you should not dismiss it outright, or nor uh, uh, think. Uh, poor about the alternate. So be open to it. Give time to evaluate others' views, approach to solving problems. There's a give and take. Uh, okay, let's try attempt what the others have to say, but review it constantly. So it needs a lot of patience, lot of persuasion. Huh? And what else would it need? Sorry? interest and a little less of ego, would you say? Huh? So that goes into again values, that it is the team effort that is very important. And uh, I will share, uh, in the process what's happened is, uh, we have done uh, uh, the volunteer platform that as part of setting up, at one point, we continue to do on a smaller scale now, uh, we, over 25 hospitals, uh, we were involved, large teaching hospitals, government hospitals, uh, in not just supporting with their IT, since we developed an open source platform, uh, and we deployed as a free service for all of them. But we were also involved in direct services. We had support from, again, a few large trusts like Tata Trust and others, and uh, we tried to improve the emergency critical care services, we deployed a large number of staff, about close to 100 people in critical care uh, areas of uh, two very large hospitals uh, in Hyderabad, to show how even in a public hospital you can get top notch. So sometimes people would uh, uh, think we are either a, a large foundation, huh? because people it's also difficult for people to understand what can be achieved through collaboration because everybody wants to pin something on just one entity or they would think we are a large IT company because we're doing so much of IT. I would, when I would have to tell them that there's no staff, IT staff we have, it's all a large open source project and not only are several volunteers contributing to this code, uh, but also in fact, there are two, three students from here, this campus, one of them, I think Anirudh is still here, who have in the last two years made small contributions to that software. Uh, several students, a lot of working professionals have contributed. So sometimes people think we are a large IT company doing all of that. And when I have to tell them, no, sorry, it's all just a volunteer group which is doing, it's a great example of collaboration. Uh, so either uh, there's complete disbelief, no, no, they must be bluffing. Or they are simply in awe that so much can be done uh, through uh, collaboration. So that is an important aspect of what collaboration can achieve. Um, and I will give a latest example. We do not know if any of you are aware, we have set up a palliative care hospital in Puttaparthi. This is one and a half year old. Uh, it, has, it has a large home care program, the 10 bed facility. and. Uh, this year, we are commencing, uh, expanding it into a full-fledged oncology, cancer hospital. That's work in progress. So, by the way, in summer, it's <laughs> in uh, summer, already it's called cancer hospital because most of palliative patients we deal with are cancer patients. If you ask any auto rickshaw fellow, if you tell them palliative, they won't understand. If you say cancer hospital, they'll take you quickly to that. So, this summer, we are actually going to be involved in the basic setup processes. So, some of you want to spend your summer in Puttaparthi, be involved hands on, you can discuss if you want to intern, uh, that is an opportunity. I will come back to about internships and uh,
for you. Remind me later. I'll just put a point to discuss with you all friendships. Not necessarily what I just indicated, but how do you spend your summer? Okay. All this theory is of little use. What is more useful is to put your hands into things and do wherever you are. Huh? Uh, so don't go to have idli, vada, sambar, dosa, uh, roti, paratha. Huh? Don't go for that. You're getting reasonably okay food. You can still have all of that. There's enough time. Huh? And uh, just to snack and uh, relive all the <laughs> delicacies. Okay. So the golden opportunity is uh, to go back and use that time to really test uh, your mind, your hand in applying yourself to something. Uh, don't be worried about whether you will achieve or not. Work alone, work with other people. I, way back in, uh, I, I did my undergrad in Parthi, I finished in 95, sorry, 98 and uh, MSc in 2000 MBA. I can't recall, I, I rarely went home because Swami was there, we would always, whenever, uh, till he went to Kodai, we would be around in Vrindavan. But the few days, I would go home, in those days, so I have not done computer science, I did my MSc physics, then MBA, but coding was something that was just always an interesting thing for me, and though we had limited uh, lab hours even then, but I, the day I would get holidays, way back in, uh, and I, in fact, right from my school days, I did my schooling as well in pra Prashantini Liam. I remember in my 6th, 7th class doing uh, basic, I don't know if you've even heard basic. Some of you wonder. I don't think you'd have heard of Pascal <laughs> those days. Then see, all of this I did before I even came to college. I would go home. The only thing I would bother parents is I used to hire a computer. Huh? Uh, 286. Those days still 486 was a is a premium thing. Huh? 286, 386 on black and white monitor, huh? CD. Uh, sorry, what is this? Floppy disk, boat. Huh? So, uh, I remember uh, my self-learning with C was to develop I, uh, a Sanskrit, since I was also very interested in Sanskrit, I developed a Devanagari script editor. Huh? I still... Okay, this is way back in... Uh, that was during my undergrad days, around 96-97. Nothing came out of it. But it's just that it's a way of I spend my time in working, looking at programming and then looking at all aspects. And uh, my MSc time, I again, interest was we had 8086 process and doing analog digital, you know, in the live lab uh, parameters and storing all that information in that you know, assembly language programming. I'm just giving this as an example to say I've never gone into pure computer science. I never done a, a job in my life uh, after I moved out of MBA. I, I had a job for seven years, but that too with a non-profit. Okay. I, I would say that it was all just doing what I love and I got paid at the end of it or <laughs> some whatever it was. And then from 2009, I've been a jobless guy. I'm a full-time volunteer leading a lot of uh, social initiatives. So. And I coordinate this entire application, okay. I work with several programmers. I don't any longer do hands-on coding. I, once in a while I, do, I, I look at code and give suggestions and things like that, but I cannot even do. I'll be very unproductive if I attempt to do any of that. But I have a certain experience, certain understanding how things work that it helps me to, over the years help me to coordinate this entire open source project we call Health for All, which is such a huge application that, as I said, people mistake us to be an IT company. So, summertime is what you should look at. It may, so like I, as I said, I did a lot of programming, not to work in an IT thing, but it's a skill that it's retained with me to do. In whatever I'm doing, add so much more value to that. That's one aspect of it. And I will also talk about something, uh, some personal reflections. I'll come back to a few other points. 
but you can interrupt me in between all of this. I, I don't want you to go silent. I was giving continuous opportunity. So the other thing I kept uh, <clears throat> in our institutions is our sports. You know, one is the classroom, then one there and all the other spiritual activities, but equally on rigorous athletics and sports. So sometimes if you saw me uh, in any of the sports speed videos, uh, I, you, will, you will say, why am I doing all this? I should be in a circus. Okay. That was my interest in athletics and gymnastics. So, but what it led me to, I never wanted, the intent again there was, we got an opportunity to present in front of Swami and usually the acrobatic team would get the privilege of showing it the maximum number of times. So, truly that was the incentive to do all of that. But, there is something else which rubbed off. It's about the discipline of rigorous physical training and uh, keeping yourself fit and knowing being a gymnast, I've injured myself several times. So I understand uh, when certain level of pain is there, I know what's the level of injury. I, I have a very intrinsic <laughs> uh, experience of knowing. And uh, so I, I continue to do I, for my age, I think I'm very fit and I, though I work in a lot of healthcare, I, I never use a doctor's service. In uh, 22 years after passing out of college, I've never got admitted into a hospital for anything, I've never taken pills. I, I just had one episode of food poisoning, you know, since I do a lot of travel and I, for that day I had to take some medicines. But barring that, uh, I've and I shouldn't boast about it. We have to all, I also have to thank God for giving that help because it's sometimes even if you're doing your best, uh, you have to be also lucky uh, not to get into trouble uh, physically. But the point is, health is such an important aspect uh, in whatever way you're working, whether you're in a regular job or you're doing something uh, on social field really doesn't matter. If you want to give yourself the best body and mind, unless your body is fit, you cannot really deliver. You can only imagine. And there was the letter there, imagination. Huh. Imagination is, uh, mind is a very fertile ground. Everybody, it is, everybody is equal in imagination. Okay. Now that God is, that is God's gift. But to translate that imagination into action, is what an enterprise is about, is about, uh, achievement is about and that requires discipline of mind, your time and most importantly body. So, it's not, see we all have 24 hours, okay, you have, your body automatically re requires a certain amount of rest, so you then you and then some basic activities of the day, you're left with about productive hours. 8 to 12 hours depending on how you apply yourself and uh, if you see there is between two people somebody achieves double the output of or triple 10 times of output of some, uh, somebody else in whatever field it is. So a lot of that depends on how fit you are and another important aspect is staying relaxed, not being stressed. Today the biggest problem is what? Stress. Okay. So that's uh, whether you're in a job or you're running your own enterprise. If you have to be effective, you have to be alert, you have to be fit, but equally stress-free. And uh, if, if you have to do justice, that's very important. And, and that's the kind of training, uh, the inputs that you get here, but it is not just to leave it here and go. If you have to take the real value out of our experience here in the campus, it is to reflect on how we manage our mind, how we manage our body and to be an efficient uh, engine, then whatever we do, we will do well. But if that stress is there, even if you are apparently f uh, in shape, physically in shape doesn't mean you are fit. Have you heard of people collapsing in gym? They are all very toned up, muscular, and suddenly they collapse. Huh? 
very young people, more and more, more such reports coming, because there's a lot of stress. And also you have to understand what are the limits of each body. And uh, so though I have been a gymnast, I don't attempt any gymnastics now. It is knowing the limits. If I do any of such things, I'll break my bones and I won't be able to. But it's a discipline. Okay. So how many of you had, uh, how many of you hit the ground this today? All of you were to games today? Huh? So I can see only two. So you just woke up, did something, had breakfast and came. Huh? How many of you did some exercise in the room itself? Even fewer. Okay. Today, even though it's not my place, in the room I had my 20 minutes of, I have my own routine of yoga, asanas and a few other exercises. So it doesn't matter whether I'm in uh, somebody's place, in some other place, hey, I'm, I'm on the move. So if you are disciplined, invest some bit of time, it has to be your call. Then only it, it becomes a routine. Otherwise, okay, today is a games day, you'll go and play. The moment uh, you are out of the campus, nobody will ring uh, buzzer, whistle or ring a bell to remind you. Where has the bell got to ring? Where should it ring? Where should the bell ring? Huh? So we have to get our, so don't wait for the external bell to ring, what to do when. We should learn to develop ringing our bell to remind ourselves and uh, as much follow. So coming back to this point about collaboration, I, I just want to emphasize that's a very core component of uh, and again just to reinforce that point, so I am neither been a technologist uh, like a computer science nor have I, no for, nor do I have any formal exposure to medicine, not studied, I am not even a biosciences guy, uh, I passed from the MPC stream. But by virtue of working constantly in the healthcare, is I've had a chance to do a lot of reading, constantly continue to do a lot of reading, not to treat patients because that's the last thing. We're not supposed to do that. Uh, we have a lot of doctors to do that. But since we have a lot of conversations with a lot of people in the healthcare profession, if you want to have a good conversation, what you, you should also be conversant with that subject, right? So another important thing to take away is, is your education here is, is, is more an exercise in exercising your brain cells to do, uh, look at problems, solving some problems at least on paper in classroom. However, when you get onto a job, like the beginning this point came up a unique problem, okay. So can you state some unique problems that you see around? Any problems you think that needs attention? Water problem, yes. What else? Any other issues? Okay, let's take this example of water. Do you have, have you studied about water, water sources, geology, so many things, water supply, water recycling, this is a whole subject by itself, there are formal things. However, since you didn't get a degree, will you stop looking at it? No. What will you do? You have learned how to learn, so you will go back, resources are available, you will pick up the relevant material. But is that enough? Will you try to reinvent the wheel? You will collaborate. You will go and find people who are actually experts in that field. But if you want to have a conversation with that expert, you also need to do your own reading, right? You have to be familiar with uh, some basics of that subject. Uh, also be able to ask the right questions so that you can uh, put these people, uh, use their expertise in the right manner. So. The learning is a continuous thing uh, and that's one important uh, aspect I wanted to bring. The next aspect I want to touch upon in uh, enterprise is sustainability. 
So is Satya Sai organization a social enterprise? Huh? But it doesn't even have a budget. Not the trust, not the Sri Satya Sai Central Trust. Central Trust gets donations, executes projects. You are familiar with Satya Sai Seva organization? It's not even a registered body. It is, it's a gathering of volunteers to do seva and other social work, spiritual work. So would you term it for the purpose of classroom discussion as a social enterprise? Yes, no. Yes. A social enterprise doesn't even have a budget, doesn't even have accounts. How does it become a social enterprise? It is right by virtue of the welfare activities and the values. That is how it is a social enterprise. So, it is not essential to have profits, is it? A social enterprise can have profits, but it need not have profits as well. Okay. Then how does it sustain? How do you sustain that activity? Hmm? Where is Satisai organization having funds? Okay. So it's, it's not about this or that. It is sustainability is about can you sustain an activity? You getting my point? So in social enterprise it's easier. It is not only dependent on funding, right? It's not dependent only on cash. Can you run a regular enterprise without cash? There it is mandatory. Uh, you, you have to pay and you have to get things done and you can retain a profit. In a social enterprise also you can pay, you can uh, get work done and but that is not, it is not 100 percent necessary. Is it right? So how does it run? It is also by people's effort. Volunteering is a an important dimension of everything cannot be monetized. Yeah, okay. When you come to a social enterprise, it is not just by money. Yes, for certain things you have to spend, you may have to raise financial resources and you have to spend it efficiently. Okay. I will take a different uh, example altogether just to drive home the point. How do you get from here to Chikbalapur? Bus stop? Huh? Oh, they tell me different modes. Huh? Auto car. Can't walk? Can walk, right? You can walk. Which is the other? Cycling. Okay. What else? You said auto car. Those require fuel, right? Huh? You need fuel, you need the, uh, a slightly higher investment vehicle. But you can still achieve the same goal <coughs> by walk or you can make it a little more efficient by cycle. Okay. So we do not have to get stuck up if I have to go to Chikbalabur distance, which is not too far. We can. Yeah, when there is an auto rickshaw available or a car, use it by all means. Okay. If it is not, you can still travel. So, a social enterprise is like this. So, yes, if, if there is financial resource, use it efficiently, use it the least, so that there is somebody who is so used to car, suddenly you tell him to walk, can he walk? He say, no, I am stuck in an island, I am stuck in, I am, uh, what is that, I am, I am at sea, they will think. But somebody who is used to walking every day will do what? Oh yeah, I am not going to waste time, I will just do a brisk walk. How much time it may take? Huh? One hour? Or at least to the main road, where you will catch a bus, some bus or something will come. 20 minutes? And I will say, I will convince myself, it is also good for my health, right? It is good for my health huh? and uh, it's, it saves me money. Two, and it achieves my goal of traveling. So, when we talk about social enterprise, keep in mind 
that yes financial resources are necessary but the work is sustained with or without it so it's about working lean okay if nothing else is there you can still do some welfare right the cause you don't have to stop applying for the cause for supporting the cause you can do it whatever the least we can we can do it it doesn't have to stop if there is resources available you can do faster and maybe you can do more but you can still apply for the cause and as we said the cause the progress can happen because of collaboration i don't have to do it alone if we develop that confidence and strength that i can work with several other organizations we can do that okay any other questions we have another 20 minutes yes okay so we started this a year the palliative center i the only formal role the only role that i have is a volunteer there <clears throat> so i'm neither the uh, director there and i want to tell you the again for me it's a great example of starting enterprises without having to be directly there a formal head and we are setting up the oncology facility i am part of the core team driving it and uh, because i already run a volunteer platform uh, called uc on which i am a director and which supports all of this but uh, last year with the alumni we set up a, another section 8 company called uh, swasthyam palliative care and cancer foundation uh, so i am not a, neither a member nor a director there but i am a very active volunteer there driving things an example of how when you say social enterprise you don't have to be a owner of it the concept of ownership need not if you are a owner it's okay it's incidental ha huh? uh you don't have to be a owner you don't have to be an employee but you can still be uh, a key driving force behind it and uh, that's my experience that because i am so much into the groove of collaboration it's evolved uh, uh, to an extent where today there's an ability to bring together uh, people so in april 22 i was we were doing a medical camp with the satsai seva organization alumni in, uh, in a place little away from puttaparthi and uh, i just got a call uh, from very senior doctor in hyderabad saying uh, uh, there's a ap government special secretary health is online he wants to talk to us to set up something in uh, ap the background was he had visited hyderabad i have been part of a larger palliative care program from the year 2016 uh, helping scaling it up uh, uh, it's an organization called palliative care society uh, doing some fantastic uh, free palliative care work uh, they have a 30 bed facility and 10 home care vans in hyderabad city so they had come to see that work and they were so happy with it they said we should have something like that in ap so we said we don't know rest of ap we will do something in puttaparthi we have always wanted to do and we just need the government uh, facilitation for you know getting the necessary approvals and <clears throat> so when on day one so this is an organization that does not have direct presence it was more that the alumni were keen to initiate it and uh, take responsibility for it so immediately in 3 months we hired a place uh, did the re- required renovations and started the palliative care how were to get all the licenses uh, we used the palliative care society in hyderabad through which we registered the entity now if it it would not have been possible to set up because a hospital is a, a legal entity there are a lot of permissions to get uh, there is uh, pollution there is fire then there is medical uh, where uh, then there is drugs there are four five departments and in which you have to uh, that another important aspect because you are doing social work 
don't expect a red carpet welcome ha you are doing so much good work please come we we'll love everything <laughs> in fact you may have more trouble getting all of that huh? more suspicion ha huh? okay let me these fellows him may be having lot of money let me trouble them hmm. so to be ready for all of that so just because you are doing good work don't expect a red carpet ha huh? you, you have to put up with uh, and deal with all the red tape and bureaucracy so we got all of that done since we didn't have a ready organization to kick start the project but we didn't want to delay and i'm again emphasizing uh, my own experience of how because of the collaboration we had such deep uh, mutual understanding collaboration respect between so many organizations in matter of 3 months from the discussion to inauguration of the facility ready for receiving patients in 3 months we did it because an existing facility we did the minor renovations to uh, do it now if if we had to set up an organization exclusive there was no ready organization or even it it would have taken much longer time so it happened so seamlessly and we had a clear understanding that we will eventually incorporate a separate organization non profit in puttaparthi and uh, then take over so which we did last uh last year in october and now uh, it's in transition uh, slowly all the licensing and all of that and it's happening in a very seamless manner and uh, to me if we didn't have this collaboration it would just be an imagination and our uh, desire that we want to do it's happened because of the collaboration of three partner organization each bringing in their strength with a common cause all of us want this facility to be there and of course like i said welfare government though there we have to put up with certain inefficiencies of the system we we did have some positive support from that inter, from the system as well because of which we could start quickly so so being open to that being optimistic and being positive about each opportunity and going forward that was uh, how it came about and uh, with the experience that we have seen uh, that a lot of cancer patients whom we support in the palliative care uh, we realized that many of them uh, the outcomes are very poor because of very poor understanding of how to do the follow up treatment lack of financial support lack of family support and distance becomes a major issue uh, take the example of breast cancer uh, which is very well understood in the western countries they have more than 90% above 90% survival rate so when you talk about survival rate in cancer it is 5 year from the time of diagnosis how many people uh, are surviving after 5 years it is in high 90s in the west and today in india we have the the same technologies that are available in the west we have the same medicines that are available in india we use the same protocols almost we have and we have as experienced or even more experienced because the sheer volume the number of cases doctors in india see uh, their experience and exposure is much far higher however our outcomes are just half so our, we have a abysmal uh, rate of uh, 50% around 50% survival rate in breast cancer and uh, when you look into these you will understand there are layers it's layers of challenges not one and that's when we said at least in that district and surrounding districts uh, let's try to address that then everything else is available in terms of technology capabilities all of that what can we do so that's how organically a lot of what the other aspect is in social enterprises not get bogged down and worried about they, see when we imagine we always imagine the end goal right the paradise everything should be fine everything or a very big goal uh but don't expect it to happen overnight and our patience should be that even in my lifetime it doesn't happen it's okay but have i applied myself have i worked with others to make some difference to it you will realize some things won't happen quickly you will realize some things happened way, way faster than what you even expected it will be a mixed bag so the, i i personally see lot of things have 
uh, I have been achieved uh, much faster than what we anticipated and some things which we thought can be achieved quickly have taken uh, much longer or are still not done. So essentially what it means that when we start something we are making assumptions. What are we doing? You are only making assumptions, you are imagining a problem, right? And you, you are recognizing a problem in your mind, you are reading about it, you are reflecting on it and uh, you, you, you have encapsulated in a certain framework the problem and then you are imagining possible solutions. Oh, what is all this? These are all imaginations or assumptions. But without that can you start? You have to start with assumptions, right? Any problem that you are solving, you have to start with assumptions. But remember they were only assumptions. Somewhere very subconsciously what happens is, we take for granted our assumptions as solutions. Do you agree? And we become very attached, very paranoid huh, to those are assumptions slash solutions. But if we stay the course and recognize that to start with I made these assumptions, some of them have been on dot, uh, they were right, some assumptions were not right, so some things have not worked. So let, let me revisit my, you make a better guess, basically what, you are, you are making a guess, when you are starting an enterprise, you are making a guesswork of, what are you making a guesswork? An educated guess, that's all you are making. You are making a guess of what the pr problem is, what the solution is, what the resources are needed and what is the resources all kinds of and what is the plan of execution in terms of timeline. All these are assumptions, you will get some of them right, okay. Some progress you will make and some things won't get accomplished. How do you handle it? Either you say, no, this is the solution, I know it. It came, it came in my dream, oh, God gave me this dream. It is the solution, it can't be anything as gospel truth. Huh? So I will continue to do that only. So you will see a lot of organizations, we, we often talk na, Kirana Dukan. You will remain a Kirana Dukan lifetime and you will expect your child also to be managing that Kirana. But some have become to become huge supply chains from there to complete uh, retailing giants. So that is one aspect, so either you get stuck or you beat a retreat, you say my god this is not for me, I will go and do a job, okay, I, I will not attempt. So enterprises that survive or thrive are where you are open to ditch your own assumptions, you should have the humility, the courage to say okay I made a reasonable assumption, it is not working. Let me go back to the drawing board, not all of it, some part of it, sometimes that reflection can come directly for you, sometimes it may come from outside. So be open to that, if you are not open to that again because all yarn will not flow directly through this antenna, <laughs> sometimes be open, it can come from other sources. So that is an important aspect and uh, I'll, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, coming to the point about internships that was up on the board. So during the summer uh, use your time uh, to get into any organization that has an opening for you and uh, you do not have to do big things again because uh, architecture is you do not nobody will even listen to you your architecture of things how it should be because you have not actually built anything, it is all imagination. So even in, uh, in all good, uh, good faith, good interest, with lot of commitment, if you give great ideas, nobody will take it. Hmm. You have to start doing basic things, then only your ideas get refined and uh, I will say as simple as if you want to go do a plumbing course somewhere, uh, go and do a carpentry course go and do a painting course, yeah. hands on, not a classroom course, yeah. go, if, if there is a CA 
who needs uh, some help in uh, verifying vouchers and you know they have their own audit process the best way you learn auditing is go go to a most serious ca who will give you a shout every day hey don't you what have you learned in the classroom huh? go read this and come and do this go if you have anybody in your family network who is a ca who are auditing some firms it doesn't matter whichever go learn offer your services for one month whatever and keep asking questions because they'll be busy the other thing is oh, i went i gave my time but nobody explained me anything no you have to ask questions uh, take their inputs uh, go join somewhere where you can do le learn and do some code don't say i'll only learn code you're already learning in the college say i'll go and do something i'll actually deliver this piece of code for you okay don't again go spend summer doing online courses you go to some firm and say i'll I, i've learned this much I, I think i need to pick up a little more i'll do this bit of code for you don't say you will do a big software okay? hundreds of coders also together can't release a software in few months and a few years okay so take something small and do it thoroughly go to a hospital and say i'll help in a little bit of you know whatever general management that i need help running around doing things so just look for any place go to a school uh, teaching or also doing some administrative works uh, look at different opportunities morning till evening okay and uh, whatever you get and that will enrich you in a big way you will be able to reflect what you learnt in the classroom and uh, how it applies what doesn't apply and when you come back next semester back to the classroom you will relate to your sessions uh, the problem i usually have i am a very bad performer in front of students because most things that i talk may not relate to you at all <laughs> okay and i generally don't like to entertain people hmm. like uh, means just to please everybody <laughs> uh, do a lot of slides presentations show pictures uh that's not of much interest to me i just like to go and keep doing things so and if you come i'll make you do things <laughs> those of you want to do. okay so uh, look at opportunities where you can uh, then only when you relate uh, even if you had the best, uh, the most experienced person here and the experts speak to you 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 will only take a little bit a small iota of what they are speaking you will only grasp more when you can relate to what they are speaking anybody your own unless you go through a certain experience you cannot experience you cannot relate to if i talk about cancer patients if some of you have had cancer patient in your family you will relate to what i am talking otherwise doesn't make any sense okay likewise any topic that we discuss if there is some context some uh, experience some exposure that you have then it makes so try to use that summer time as be like a sponge to absorb as much uh, no don't worry so much about your tummy and your tongue uh, your whole life to take care of it uh, i'll stop here Are there any final questions we can take otherwise uh i'll just end with uh, one last point uh, this more to reflect as i said when you do social enterprise just because you're doing seva don't expect uh, red carpets or even gates to be opened and people to talk to you uh, people may actually say why are you doing this uh, are not necessary uh, or uh, you are misusing resources and whatever other things they can do and you have to deal with everything you have to deal with law you have to comply with law there will be sometimes for a small bit of work you have to comply the cost of compliance i don't know if that was discussed was that discussed compliance cost is because you have to comply with so many uh, regulatory aspects uh, once you have an enterprise you have uh, just not just from ministry of corporate affairs you have income tax you have uh, pf you have professional tax you have uh esi uh, various taxation compliances and depending on industry you are in again the industry related compliances 
and even if you are you make your best of effort i i can guarantee you somebody can come and catch you and say you are you have neglected uh, some aspect of law or uh, you are on the other side of the law in something because we have such a web of laws that most lawyers and cas also won't know all of it they'll say ah when it comes to it we'll handle it <laughs> that's the thing so i have had to handle uh, despite all the best efforts uh, i have had to go to labor courts huh? and handled the cases and uh, now i am in the midst of uh, a case uh, that i have to go to high court to huh? and uh, for some uh, some very insignificant administrative delay in a taxation matter uh, and so uh, our uh, legal opinion was that we have, we have facts completely on our side so we will go to high court so why, why i am bringing the bringing up these is if if you shy away from this you cannot say i did in my good faith all of this i worked hard i toiled hard why am i being put through all this huh. you have uh, it's it's a crown of thorns uh, if you are willing to go the social entrepreneurship way huh? uh, that's what i have to say but that shouldn't scare you hmm. uh, because that's the path a, a, any uh, social path is is not just a, a red carpet or a uh, or a rosy path uh, you have to also handle the thorns along the way and be prepared for it uh, i am seem to be ending on a very cautious note but uh, yeah caution is equally important yes aram sir just one question one question uh, right like nowadays many companies are using social enterprise like they have started social enterprise for the sake of marketing so is it like ethically ethically correct so i don't don't do any uh, hair splitting on definitions of social enterprise as i said <clears throat> there are companies even far, way before csr came by their value system they said they will do a lot of social work csr came it's opened up the mindset of all companies some use it not a very uh, great way some use it as a good way and um, then there is also an industry of social and there are venture capital which wants to specifically support uh, enterprises that are in in some sectors and some spaces so and then as i said there are organizations which are not necessarily dealing with a lot of capital they are doing a lot of work with very less capital or almost no capital and when we say capital it is just not just financial capital there is a lot of social capital we say right the volunteer participation from my end i am done if there are any final questions otherwise i think break time 10:30 i am around today so if you want to have uh, some one on one interactions i am around so can uh, we can connect as well thank you sairam thank you sir for the eye opening talk sir i believe as everyone here would that looking at entrepreneurship through the social lens with a genuine interest and love is far better than the profit lens to live a stress free happy and a fulfilling life i'm sure everyone here resonate with you sir and will pick up this philosophy of yours so i hope we have similar opportunities with you in the future to help us imbibe the qualities that make us a good entrepreneur thank you once again sir now i request our revered guest Mr P Vishwas to hand over the token of gratitude to Mr Gunaranjan sir
I'm here today to introduce the next speakers for the day. But they don't require any introduction to the most of us. He has been an active part of our third VBA students for the past year, helping us learn from digital marketing to taking us on an insightful industrial visit. Still, the, for the benefit of our juniors and all those tuned online, Sir finished his BCA from Sitams Hyderabad and completed an MBA from JNTU Hyderabad. He has worked in various MNCs like Infosys, Reuters, Amazon, and is currently the Vice President of Account Management Services at Ticametrics, where he is responsible for having taken this universe, uh, taking this organization in India from scratch to having overtaken its par uh, parent company in the US. With a 19 years plus of e-commerce experience, I can't wait for you to experience learning from him as we have had the chance to do. Vishwas sir today is today accompanied by an amazing entrepreneur. We had the opportunity to meet him and learn from him when we visited his business, JK Brands and Solutions in Bangalore and Hosur. He's a very motivated and resilient person when it comes to his business. He also is a marketing director for Napkin Sleep. Previous to this, he worked with Mr. Vishwas at Ticametrics and also at Amazon. Academically, he completed his MBA from IIPM and also went as a student exchange program to Cornell University. Without taking much time, I invite both of them to the podium. Thank you, sir. Sairam, thank you. Uh, my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our Bhagwan Sai Baba, revered elders, professors, lecturers, and my dear students. Firstly, thanks for giving me this wonderful opportunity. It always, it always feels refreshing and rejuvenating to come and meet you all. And um, uh, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. So the topic I've been assigned today is uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, innovation thinking and entrepreneurship. So uh, I think the time slot that I have is the next one and a half hour. The way I'll do it is I'll take the next 30 minutes sharing experiences from my journey. Um, I want to keep it as interactive as possible. So we'll uh, please participate in this discussion, share your views, share your thoughts. I'll try and try my best to keep it interactive. And the next 30 session, I'll hand it over to Sunil who I've known him for the last 12 to 15 years. Um, I've known him since Amazon days. He's worked for me in Ticometrics, and now he's a successful entrepreneur, still early days, but a long way to cover. So he will talk about more about the entrepreneurship. And then what I also want to do is, the third year students had the privilege of visiting his facility, which is in Koramangla and the Hosur. But for the benefit of the first and second year students, we will show you on Zoom how his facility looked like. So he'll talk about his entrepreneurship journey, and then he'll also take you through his manufacturing facility, which is in Hosur. It may be a repetition for third year students, but bear with us, OK? Cool. So uh, I'll focus more on talking about my experiences, because lecturing can get boring until, like Gunranjan sir said, until you jump into the fire, you go do it yourself. Right? Uh, so I don't want to lecture here. I'll, I'll t share more experiences of my journey. But before we get there, um, quick question. What do you think is innovation? Anybody who can tell me what is innovation in your mind, in your head? How do you think about innovation? Creative? Creative ideas. OK. Anybody else? Thinking? Out of the box? What does, what does thinking out of the box mean? Somebody said thinking out of the box. So what does thinking out of the box mean? Getting out of a box and then thinking? No? So, in a, so to think in a different way, sir. In a different way, yeah. So let's say if you had a task, you were taking, like, you had a goal, and you were taking five tasks to complete that journey and hit the goal. Now, how do you think differently in, like, hey, can you do the task in four steps? Can I reduce the time and still get to the end state? So that's 
thinking outside of the box. Anybody else? One more example. What is innovation to you? Just one more response. Anybody? From the first year? BBA first year. Go on. Nothing is right or wrong. Doing the same regular things in an easier and effective way. Doing the same thing in easier and efficient and efficient effective way. and effective way. Now, when I talk about this word innovation, when I talk about this word innovation, tell me some personalities that come to your mind. Anyone, just raise hand and tell me one personality why that person comes to your mind and why. Yeah, please. Steve Jobs. Awesome. So who is Steve Jobs? And why do you say, hey, innovation, I, I recollect Steve Jobs? Change the technology of in the bits. Right. Have you heard his famous speech where he was launching the, yeah. How many of you have listened to his famous speech? If you have not, you should go back and look at it. That was revolutionary, OK? Anybody else? So somebody said Steve Jobs. Two more people. So which, which year are you? Second year. From the first year and the third year. Yeah. Charles Babbage. Why? Why do you think he's an innovator? Perfect. So uh, this brother says Charles Babbage because he invented the computer. Today we are all, like, without computers, can we think of our life? No, right? So one more. Which year are you? Thank yes, you. Yes, Third yes, year. Sir. My sir. students. Sairam, sir. Sairam. The personality which comes to my mind is Mr. Elon Musk. Elon Musk? Yes, sir. Awesome. So why, why do you think he's an innovator? Sir, like, if you see the Tesla cars, like, no, nobody would have thought in that way to make cars so, so innovative, so super cool, like auto driving features. Then we have the first electric car in the world was, I think, by Tesla. And then space exploration, he he's one of the leading entrepreneurs in space exploration in the private field. Because if we see space is a government-dominated sector, but still he has revolutionized it. And Starlink is also one of the top-notch companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Elon Musk. Yeah. Elon Musk, great innovator. Some crazy ideas, but that's innovation, right? Taking it to the next level. Now, I would have expected an answer saying, sir, I am also an innovator. Like each one of you, each one of you. So we have, to, we have spoken about Steve Jobs. We have spoken about Charles Babbage briefly. We have spoken about Elon Musk. Reflect back into your individual lives, right? As a student life or staying in the hostel, BBA graduates. Recall an incident where you have innovated, and can any one of you give me one example? All of us are innovating. Like, some way or the other, consciously or unconsciously, we are trying to innovate. Can you, any one of you recall an example where you tried, okay, you were doing it this format, I tried innovating it, this is what has happened. Can any one of you give me an example of where you innovated in your daily life? Innovation is nothing but improving the current process. You can improve the current process in a number of ways. Reduce the number of steps, reduce the time, make it more efficient, get, get you reaching to the goal much faster in a quality manner. So there's, it's all, ultimately it's improving what you're doing, right? So recall of an incident where you have innovated in your daily life and can any one of you share one example? Please. Recently, there was a problem in hostel, like uh, we were segregating waste and dump, and uh, eventually it was getting burnt. So uh, we came up with with an idea of segregating the waste, so that we now we are also able to generate some kind of wealth through it. The waste which was getting burnt in the dump and which was uh, diluting the environment is now somewhat is getting like proper segregation. Awesome. Do you know that the waste management is the biggest problem in the world today? Do you know that? Right? People make a lot of money by just giving ideas about how to manage waste. 
waste management is one of the biggest problems. So this idea of waste management, was it your idea or who gave the idea? Was it sirs or was it students? So Satish Chandra came, Satish Chandra sir came to our campus. He gave uh, very good insights about it, like how he's doing it in other places and thought of it. Perfect, awesome. So you, you got some inputs from somebody who came as a guest lecturer and he shared his experiences and yes. from that you absorbed yes. it and you tried to solve it in your daily life. Brilliant example. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Another initiative that was taken by the campus was uh, introducing podcasts because uh, a lot of people around the world don't know much about this campus because it started late. So it was an initiative by our own campus only, uh, seniors, our seniors, us PG brothers. So we started podcasts with firstly with teachers. They, the teachers were there from the inception of the college. So we got to know their experiences, how the college was built, and how the activities were going through. That was one initiative that. Awesome. That's another innovation, right? So if you look in the first example, was there a problem in that example? Was there a problem in the waste management? There was a problem, right? So innovation can, one way innovation can occur is if you're having a problem. If you are attentive enough to identify the problem, right? And how do you assess these, how do you see these problems? How do you identify, hey, where is the problem? How do you see these problems? Anybody? How do you see these problems? How do you identify problems? So one way of innovation is you identify a problem area and then you try and go innovate trying to solve that problem. Now, how do you see problems? Anybody? That section, this section is active. Maybe that section of the group. Or how do you innovate? Yeah, please. Absolutely. So let's say you are doing, you're doing that task yourself. If you're doing the task yourself and you're actually, let's say it takes you 10 steps and you're doing the same tasks again and again and again and again and again and it takes you so much time and you're like, let's say you're not enjoying it. You're not enjoying it. Like every day, let's say you were supposed to do these 10 tasks without fail. For the first month, you'll be very happy, motivated, you'll be enjoying it. After a month, will it become monotonous? it'll become monotonous. Now, when it becomes monotonous, don't just live with it or don't get adjusted to it, right? When it gets monotonous, that's a problem that you need to identify and see a better way of executing the, or executing the task by applying innovation. Now, um, since I work for Amazon, I'll take a lot of examples from Amazon because Amazon to me is one of the best companies that have constantly kept innovating in everything and anything it has done right from the day one when Jeff Bezos started his, um, the book reading store from his garage to what they are now. All of you are familiar with Amazon, right? Right? Um, and um, uh, what I would also urge is, they have these 14 leadership principles. Now they have added two more. So it's actually 16 leadership principles. And I strongly believe, I strongly believe that the 16 leadership principles that Jeff Bezos has quoted, which are the leadership principles that every Amazonian follows, are universal in nature, universal in nature. So one task I would like you all to do is coming out of this session, when you have free time, all of you have lab hours, right? In between your periods, I, I see some people sitting in the lab and surfing, collecting data, doing research. So just look for Amazon leadership principles, Amazon leadership principles, and you will see about 16 of them. Just spend some time reading through it. The reason I say that is you need to have those qualities to be able to innovate, find new ways of doing your work and solving the problem. Now in the second example that this brother gave us, was there a problem? Was there a problem in the use case that you gave? Why did, you had to, why did we have to do the podcast about this campus? Only? Was there a problem or not really? Can I say that he's just looking to improve, improvise, right? He's just trying to find an opportunity and improvise, right? So what I'm trying to say is innovation doesn't come by locking yourself into a room, seeing a blank wall 
and trying to innovate. It doesn't come that way. It doesn't come that way. It just comes by inward looking. Swami says this, inward looking. Look into yourself or look into what you're doing and carefully examine every step by step. What is the upstream process? What is the downstream process? What is leading A to B, B to C, C to D? I'll give you a simple example. Or maybe we can use this as a scenario. When I was working for um, Infosys, that was my first job. Just like you, I graduated out of my MBA. And uh, I, was, uh, I got hired as a process associate. Process associate. Uh, the client that I was working for was uh, Alcova, Aluminium Company of America, but I was an employee of Infosys. Now, what was I doing? I was part of the account payables. All of you understand what is account payables? What is account payables? If you have to tell it uh, in single line, what is account payables? The process which manages the payments to all your vendors, right? Electricity, raw material, all of your inventory stuff, right? So I was working on the accounts payable process and in the accounts payable process, the important part is you have the utility services, you have your raw material, and you need to make sure your payments are promptly being made to your suppliers and vendors so that there's no disruption in the operations. Clear with me? So accounts payable process is nothing but I'm responsible for making sure Alcova company is making timely payments for their suppliers and vendors on time so that there's no interruption in any of the other manufacturing assembly process or anything of that sort, okay? Now, that's, the, that's what the accounts payable process is broadly about. But what was my role in this team? My role was Alcova used to release payments via checks to its suppliers, okay? So there was a, we, we used to work on Oracle software and every day we would see, hey, who are the suppliers who have due dates of that day? And then we would release a batch of checks those checks will get printed at the headquarters and there is a team who will take those checks and mail it to the suppliers. Yeah, you're following my example? Now, uh, my responsibility was, when we send a lot of these checks, hundreds of checks go out every day, hundreds of checks to all these utilities because this company was pretty well known in US and it has a lot of these branches and we had hundreds of suppliers. So, when these checks went out to the suppliers, right, Many checks got returned to the Alcoa office. I send a check, after two weeks, the check is back at the Alcoa office. And I was responsible for making sure, understanding why the check is back, and why did the payment not go. Because if the payment did not go, the supplier can cut my service. It can be electricity, it can be the raw material, it can be water, it can be whatever I need to do for manufacturing my products. And when any such disruption happens, you know what is the cost implication? Your manufacturing process comes to a grinding halt, right? So there was utility payments, which was like the most critical. There is no way we can disrupt these processes. And there were non-utility payments, which is the other negotiations part. And my responsibility as a process associate was, hey, I need to look into all these checks that have been returned and understand why they have been returned and then try and see whether we need to issue the payments again, okay? And let's say, um, again, I'm giving you some hypothetical stats, but what I fairly remember was, if I received 100 checks back, good 60% of the checks were returned because the address mentioned on the postal courier was incorrect. 60% of the checks were returned to Alcova because the address mentioned on the uh, check was incorrect. And what was I trained? When I took over the process, my trainer trained me saying, hey, you'll need to look into the check. You'll need to see, they, they tell you, they tell you why the check is returned. So you'll need to look into the reason. And because the, in this particular case, the check is returned due to a wrong address, the process was, hey, look up that supplier in the system and see if there is an alternate address and send the payment to the alternate address. This is what I was trained. All of you clear with the example? And every day, I would go to Infosys. I was staying in Malayshwaram. My office is in Electronic City. I was doing a US shift. My office starts at 4.30. So I get picked up at 4.30, reach the office at 6 o'clock. 6 to midnight 2, I'm only looking at checks. I have about 1,000 checks I need to look at, see the reason, figure out the reason, what is the correct action that I need to take. And like I said, 60% of the checks that got returned is because address was incorrect. And what was my process? Look up the supplier, 
see if there is an alternative address and send the payment to that address. This was trained. This was what I was trained. And I did this for a year long. And I was happy. I was happy doing this. Like review, press the button, send it again. Okay? Now, this is the situation. This is what was I was trained. Do you see a flaw in this whole process? I was told, send it to the other address and also see if there are any other upcoming payments that are going to the same address. Send those also to the other address. That was what I was taught. Given this scenario, what is the problem or there's, there is still a flaw in this whole process. Can anybody tell me what is the flaw here? The database or something would have been wrong. The, the data in the database sometimes will be a misspelling or something which... Yes, that could be one of the possibility. Any other possibilities? Like just focus on the corrective action that I am doing. I get a return check. I need to see the reason for why the check is returned and 60% of the checks was wrong address. And what was my corrective action? I used to see if the supplier has an alternate address and route the payments to the alternate address. Also see if any other payments have been released for the future dates and route all those payments to the second address. This was what I was trained and I did this for a year without knowing like, okay, there's the right process. But after a year, it took me, after, it took me a year to realize the flaw in the process. Can anyone of you tell me what's the flaw here? Please. Sir, perhaps we could uh, delete the wrong address from the database and directly source it to the correct address. Awesome. You have saved one year of your lifetime. You have saved one year of your lifetime. So here, what was I doing? I was looking up the supplier. I was tagging all the payments to the other address. And I was also sending this return check to the other address. But I, was, I did not take out the wrong address. So what was happening? Next day, there were again a bunch of payments going to the wrong address. And again, those, after two weeks, those come. And I did this like a year. I did this for a year. Right? And then, after a year, after doing this for a year, I, and you know how much Infosys was paying me for this? 8,000. Infosys was paying me 8,000 for this. And I was fine. And uh, I'll tell you how I got irritated with this problem. Along with me, there were 10 other people who joined. So we were all one batch. And uh, after a year, I was the only one who was in, in Infosys. Everybody who joined with me either went to Deutsche Bank, because in Electronic City, there are a number of companies. Once you finish work, you can just step out, take an interview in the neighboring company. Right? And if you land on offer, you can hop. That was how it is. Now, I think, I don't know, maybe because of the upbringing here, I was a little more loyal. And uh, I stayed back in Infosys. But all my people left. And surprisingly, they all left for two companies, Deutsche Bank. And there was one more company. I think it was Capgemini or something. And you know what? They were paid 20,000. They got paid 20,000. And every day, they would come and tell me, hey, you're still here. I'm hoping now, I'm going to Capgemini, 20,000. They would come and tell me this. So when they came and told me this, right, something started inside. Hey, what, am, what the hell am I doing here? Right, I was happy. I was happy. If you isolate them, I'm happy with what I'm doing. I would put 3,000 for my Bangalore expenses, and I would send 5,000 to my dad for his expenses. Now, when this started, right, it started troubling me, saying, what the hell am I doing? And because of that, I could have chosen two options. One is look for an opportunity in Deutsche Bank or Capgemini. But then what I chose to do, again, I'm not boasting, okay? Like, I want you to learn the crux of it. What I said is, hey, how do, how, how do I make my work more interesting? How do, how do I make my work more interesting? So when I started looking into the process, I noticed this process flaw. And uh, when one of the senior manager came, like we were working on a Diwali day, I remember, uh, and usually Diwali day, the senior managers come and appreciate us because we are compromising our time with the family. We are working the night shift and all that. So they come, they give us sweets and all that. Now, the senior manager happened to come that day and he came to appreciate us. And he happened to ask us like, hey, how is everything going? That was an opportunity for me. I clinged on to that. I said, we are happy, but we need to improve our processes. And then he asked me like, can you talk more? And then, I started to tell him, but because he's at a senior level, he's looking at the process from 6,000 feet. So he doesn't really understand what I say. For him, 
he understands what his subordinates say, which is like four levels between him, him and me. So then I said, can I schedule 15 minutes with you? He was like, I think that was an opportunity that I clinged on to. He said, yeah, let's set up some time. And I went into his cabin. I took my laptop. I showed him like, hey, this is what we're doing in this process. I've been doing this for a year. 60%, I just backed it up with data saying, hey, this many transactions I've done in the last one year. This is the number of checks, 60% returning because of wrong address. And my process says this. There is still a flaw. And this is what we need to do. You know what was the impact of that? I got a promotion. I got a promotion. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to tell you is, Look at the behavior that was displayed to get the incentive. I could have easily chosen to jump to Deutsche Bank, 20,000. Did I do that? No. Again, I'm not boasting, okay? It's not for boasting. I just want you people to focus on the right items. That was an opportunity. I could have let go on this opportunity. Nobody spoke. Only, I was the only one who spoke. And he, I asked for, I had the guts to ask him for like, hey, give me 15 minutes of your time. And I went into his cabin and I did my homework. I didn't go and talk nonsense in that 15 minutes because I knew that is the time window that I have to present my case with him. So I did all my research, no presentation, just data. 15 minutes, I showed him the problem and this is what it is and I said, yes, let, let's do this, okay? And he actually took me to his direct reportee who is one of the senior managers there. He said, hey, let's get this process implemented. And within a month, all of that was implemented. So the process was, in addition to routing the payments to an alternative address, and also routing this payment which just got out to alternate address, deactivate that other address. So what happened? No other payments went to that address. And you know how much we saved? Any idea, rough idea, how much we saved in terms of the cost? Just because of that one small step that we did? Just a wild guess. Uh, 250K dollars every month. A process associate sitting in Bangalore working for an Alcoa company in the US looking into his process to identify a flaw, just saying, how many, how many clicks it took to deactivate that address? One click. But that's the right click to do. And because of that, the impact was 250K dollars saved. And the company got 250K. They gave me only 8,000 more. So that's a different story, right? But what I'm trying to say is, you should be attentive in everything and anything that you do you will see opportunities. There will be something that will be troubling you. Now, you need to channelize that trouble. That I call fire, passion. You should have fire in you. And you need to channelize that in the right format. So that was my first, that was my first innovation opportunity where I did the right thing and I got incentivized. And I got 16,000. Like my salary grew to 16,000. And then whoever told me like I'm with Deutsche Bank, uh, I'm getting 20,000. I said, I'm, I've got 100% bump as well. And I've also got recognition with the leadership. And I still remember the manager's name, Devesh Kanna. He is a, a, a guy from Delhi, from IIM, and I still remain in contact with him. Like, I built a connection. And trust me, Sunil will tell you the importance of connections. For you to pursue your path, connections are supremely, supremely important. You need to build connections. Okay, that's first example. And that's when I tasted the... Um, all of you have seen this movie, uh, 1983, right? What is the phrase there? Taste success once. Taste the success once. You want more. Taste the success once, you want more. Go back and look at the 1983 movie. This is about that Kapil Dev winning the World Cup. So there he uses a phrase. How he motivated the India cricket team is, he was not good in English. He knew his butler English. Whatever, uh, he would, if he had to communicate with his team, Indian team, he would first think about it in Hindi or Punjabi, and he would do a literal translation of that in English. So he, the phrase that he used with his team was, taste success once, your tongue want more. That's how we motivated the Indian cricket team, and we went on to win the World Cup. So anyways, that's a, sub, a separate thing. Now, um, so that was my first uh, encounter with innovation. And... Uh, then I happened to move to Amazon, and Amazon, trust me guys, like in, again, I'm not, I'm not a brand ambassador for Amazon. I'm not a brand, brand ambassador for Amazon, but what Amazon gave me, and Sunil will agree to it, is it gave me the right platform to think about, uh, look at the business in the right format, right? And they kept constantly innovating. Amazon kept constantly, constantly innovating, right? Anybody, um, like, 
When did Amazon launch? Any idea? 19? 94, 95? Yeah, it's not like 100 year old company, it's recent times. But back then, 94, 95, did anybody think that, hey, there is so much space for this internet and e-commerce? No, Jeff Bezos thought through it. Like he wanted to make the life of the customer super easy and convenient, such that I can sleep in my cot, have a small mobile in my hand, and order everything and it'll be at my doorstep. So that guy saw it then. Just imagine if he didn't see that then. Do you think Amazon, you know how big is Amazon, right? Just to give you a simple picture, when I joined Amazon, the Amazon stock price was $242. One stock, Amazon was $242. After seven and a half years when I exited, one stock, $3,550. Every year it grew 100 plus, 100 percent plus, 100 percent plus. Every year, if you look at the stock price, go look at the stock chart, every year the Amazon stock price grew more than 100 percent. And why do you think it grew? Why do you think it grew? Yes, they were a pioneer in the e-commerce space, but they did a lot of things right. They did a lot of things right. And what did, I'll give you some examples of what Amazon did right. Uh, how Jeff Bezos and his leadership looked at the problems. So his mission statement was, hey, I want Amazon to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. That's his mission statement, right? Now, if Amazon wanted to achieve that status, Earth's most customer-centric company, Earth's most customer-centric company. Who do you think are the customers for Amazon? Shoppers? All of us, all of us are shoppers. That's one set of customer. Is there another customer? Seller? Seller is also a customer, right? Customers will not come if there are no sellers there. So, now, interestingly, Amazon had two customers, two customers that he has to keep happy to get to that vision state. So what did he do? Did he choose the, sell did he choose the sellers first or the customers first? Sorry? How many of you say sellers? Raise it fully, no half, fully. Okay, how many of you say customers? Awesome, so there are fewer people for customers than sellers, okay? What Amazon did is, they chose the shopper, end shopper first. They started their journey with the end shopper. And um, if I can just show the uh, video of... Oh, sorry. I'll just play you a small video. Rather than telling in words, look at how uh, Jeff Bezos approached his model, focusing... So his vision was, I want to be the most customer... And what I'm going to show you now is what he told his senior leadership about bank. Like this. Then we had the 30 minutes break, right? So similarly, there was a board meeting, a break. And one of the VP asked Jeff, why do you think this company will succeed? What is your business model for this? And he took a tissue paper, which is the, the desk. And he said, hey, this is my business and this is why I think it works. And the business model is what I'm going to project and show. I think that'll be more.
taken the liberty of converting it into PowerPoint. And the way you read this thing is you start with customer experience. So we want to have, in order to grow our company, a fantastic customer experience. If we do, we know we'll get lots of traffic. Lots of consumers will be interested in that customer experience. They'll hear about it through word of mouth. They'll have their own experiences, and they'll come to the website. Well. customer experience. So what, what was his thought process is, let's say if he gave the best customer experience. Obviously more and more customers, shoppers will come onto his website, so that will drive a lot of traffic, right? When you drive a lot of traffic, would that not be an incentive for sellers to come and get onboarded onto his platform? If there are no customers, do you think sellers will come and list their products? No. So we wanted to focus on this one, which will generate a lot of traffic then that will attract a lot of sellers to come and list their products on their platform. Now when you get a lot of sellers on your platform, what happens? The selection increases. You can find everything and anything in, out there in the world on Amazon platform. So obviously that improves the selection. And when selection is great, let's say anything and everything that you want to buy, it's available on Amazon. What happens? Doesn't it result in the customer experience? Right? So that was the vicious cycle, that was the flywheel, and it's a closed loop. Always it should be a closed loop. And what he did was, he ingested energy into every bit of these elements. And what did he do? So customer experience. For customer experience, what do you think would keep you as a shopper happy? Low prices. Now, when the company grew and got the leverage in cost structure, did he pay out as dividends? Or did he do the stock split or he, low, he chose to lower the prices? 
he chose to lower the prices because his goal was, hey, I have to give the customer experience. He could have given it in dividends. But if I give it in dividends, is the end shopper getting benefited or the people who have invested in the company stock getting benefited? Dividend goes to the shareholders. But who was his customer? The shoppers like us. So he chose not to give dividends, but he chose to lower the prices. That was again resulting in customer experience. So one is lower price. What are the benefits that you think you would want? Fast shipping. Fast shipping. All of you have heard about Prime. How many of you are Prime subscribers? And generally, if you are an Amazon customer, you will choose Prime. Right? Why? Because he said, hey, if you take the Prime subscription, I will deliver it in one day. Uh, and look at the way he did it. Fast shipping is what the customer wants. Right? If he doesn't deliver fast shipping, it's a problem for the customer, right? But he created a subscription which is Prime membership, but then he, unlike Gunranjan sir, what he said, social enterprise and all that, this is slightly, this is more commercial. So he created the Prime subscription and he started to monetize it, saying that, hey, if you want your products to be shipped to you in one or two days, take the Prime subscription, but you need to pay me 1,000 rupees a month. Right? So he converted the problem into a business opportunity there. So he's making you pay for the customer experience. See how smart he is. He tells, I want to be the best customer, like I want to give the best customer experience, but then he's making you pay for the customer experience. But that's business, that's e-commerce. So turning your problems into opportunities. So he lowered the prices. He started to create prime membership, which is giving you genuine products, fast shipping. Any other benefits that you think you want? As a shopper, yeah, delivery we saw. There's also flexible returns policy, cashback policies. You get access to the deals, discounts, whenever there's a great Indian festival sale. Who gets the access to the early deals first? The prime subscribers. So along with charging, he's also incentivized the shoppers with certain privileges, right? Now, what did he do? Like, only meeting this end is not enough. He also has to take care of these guys, right? So what, generally, what are the challenges that the sellers face? Inventory, yeah. A bigger problem? Competition, yeah, there's a way he solved that problem, but let's say if I'm a, if I'm, the, the biggest challenge that sellers face is delivery. Delivery and making sure the product reaches the right customer on time. That's the biggest problem today. And what did he do? He created a package called Fulfillment by Amazon. You know what is Fulfillment by Amazon? Like he says, Hey, you sellers, you don't have to worry about the delivery. Just ship all your products to the nearest Amazon warehouse. I will stock them up. I will receive the orders. I will package your product and I will send it to the customer. Right? You don't have to worry about the delivery. Now, if you are a seller and delivery is your biggest problem, will you choose this or not? You'll obviously choose. And what did he do? He converted the problem into a business opportunity. Hey, you need to pay me for the FBA. How much of a square feet you are taking in my warehouse space, you need to pay a certain commission. So here also he has monetized it. Here also he has monetized it. Right? You see the outlook, how he's going about it. So that's the smartness, right? How do you convert your problems into, he didn't sit cribbing saying, hey, this is a problem that I have, that's a problem that I have, what do I do? He looked at the problem, he carefully studied it and tried to innovate and put solutions there along with making it a business opportunity, all right? So in the interest of time, uh, there's a lot more that I thought I'll cover, but um, I also want to make sure Sunil sir covers about entrepreneurship. And the interesting part will be the last 15 minutes where you see, he will talk more about his entrepreneurship journey. So uh, talking a little about Sunil, um, uh, he worked for the same team that I did. I was his manager and uh, I'm a very strict manager. Um, like people dread to work with me and that is because I'm very strict and uh, he, in Unlike others, he was one person who always wanted to work with me. And why? Because he knew that they, when you work under a strict manager, you learn. And I was like, no, you should not come and work with me. You should stay in your own team. But then he was relentless. He was relentless. He came and worked for me. And uh, only to find that after he came to join my team, two months, I was quitting Amazon. Like he came thinking he'll work with me. But as soon as he moved to my team, I quit Amazon saying, hey, Tata, bye bye, I'm going. Where am I going? I'm going to a startup because just like he looked at me as a mentor, I look at one more person who is Srinivas Gurenti as my mentor. And that mentor was starting a new company and I wanted to follow his journey.
So the key call out here is identify mentors. Like we are not knowledgeable, but when you interact with these mentors who have seen their, who, who have experienced it in their life, right? You can take a lot of learnings. Now, just imagine if you go to accounts payable process and you're told, hey, you need to process these return checks. Day one, you'll tell, hey, I'll go give this idea. Right? So you have cut down, like you fast forwarded your life story by one year. So always look for mentors who can give you their valuable lessons and life experiences. It might have taken them years for them to learn that. But by just by hearing those experiences, you learn a lot. So I moved to Tika Metrics. He joined me. So he followed me along the way. And uh, he worked for me for three years. He was one of my first employees for uh, Tika Metrics. And when I, when I joined Tika Metrics, there was no office. There was no nameplate. I was the first employee for when I say first employee, I and my um, manager co-founded that together. And uh, the goal that my manager gave me in the first time was, he had a discussion with me on Friday. He told me like one week, I want you to hire three people and three solid people who can really work it out for our company. And uh, I came out of Amazon and people looked at me like an idiot. Because who will, who will leave Amazon? Senior manager, I'm getting two on-site travel every year. I go to all the metro cities for my hiring. I have a big campus, a brand behind me, but then I decided, like, literally I have to tell you that my father-in-law looked at me like an idiot and he called me to his place. He said, what the hell are you doing? And this was after two years of getting married. Like I got just recently married. And uh, he, started, he started chewing my brain, saying like, how are you gonna take care of my daughter? Why are you leaving Amazon? All that. Like I literally had to spend one and a half hour explaining him like, hey, I know what I'm doing. Because, I was not happy in Amazon. Uh, it was just like, do the same damn thing every day. You don't just go out, you can't explore your capabilities. So anyways, um, uh, it's, it's a little interesting story. So thankfully, they follow one Guruji who see the horoscopes. So he said, hey, I want us to meet that person with your horoscope. I said, go, let's go. I've decided I'm moving. Whatever you do, you do, but I'm coming. So we, I took, he literally took my horoscope. He went to that Guruji. I sat there, he sat there. And uh, that fellow doesn't know his horoscope, by the way. Yeah, we give the horoscope, and my father, with all my due respect, him. Okay, not that I'm pulling his leg. <laughs> They're just concerned. Their daughter, their son-in-law, that is there. So uh, then, what happens is um, he gives my horoscope to that person, and he says, uh, "Sir, how is his future in terms of job for the next five years?" Thanks to that fellow, he said, "Sir, next 38 years, solid pushpa two style." Only rise, <laughs> only rise and rule, no decline. I was like, thank you, sir, thank you. So ultimately, only when that fellow told my father-in-law saying that thir next 38 years, some Rahu Lagna, this one is all done, all bad time is over, good time is only there, next 38 years, no solid looking back. He was convinced that I have to make this move. That's how people are, like, again, their own trusts, beliefs, and all that. And then I made a move to this company, and uh, it's an interesting story. I'll just take 10 more minutes, Sunil, because it's important to, for you guys to know. So I was the first employee, and Amazon, you know, the, you know how the office spaces are? Huge office spaces. 350 people, 500 people sitting on a shop floor with cafeterias. You have accessibility to the library. You have all the facilities and all that. And I moved with, to this company with my senior, and uh, he said, Ashwantpur um, um, is our office space. I know this guy very well. Like, he is like, awesome mentor whom I joined hands with. So I just trusted him and believed him because I worked with him in Amazon for almost eight years. I knew his capabilities. Um, but then when I quit Amazon, um, I asked him where is the office? He said, you know WTC? Orion Center, you know the WTC, right? He said, come there. I was like, oh wow. So Amazon was also there only, okay? And then he said, or, uh, World Trade Center. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna miss much because Previously for Amazon also, I worked in that World Trade Center, which was a 16th floor building. And when I asked him where is the office, he said, come to World Trade Center. So I was like, okay, thank God. So there's not much change. There's no many, too many variables change. I took the metro, I landed on WTC. Then I call him up again saying, asking where is the office. He said, come a little further down from WTC. Don't enter WTC, go straight further down from WTC. I said, okay, should I not go into WTC? No, I'm not going. I said, come further down. I walked for like half a kilometer. I saw a school, I saw an auto stand, I saw that. And I'm like, dude, where, where is this office now? I said, come a further half kilometer down. I walked further down. There was a, I think, um, there was an office, um, there was a, a, a shared office location. 
and he said, hey, you see that board there? Yes, I see the board. Come to the second floor. They go to the second floor, and uh, I was a not, he didn't know me, so I'm like, whom do you want to meet? I told my manager's name. I said, yeah, yeah, please come, please enter in the register. So they took my details. They gave me a temporary access card. They said, left, right, second room. Left, right, second room. And I'm coming with this perception of working in Amazon space. Office space. 350. Yes, all of that. And I took a left, right, opened the door. They opened the door. And that was my biggest shock. The office space was just this much. The office space was literally this much. Nine tiles. That was a culture shock for me. Like, okay, have I landed in the right place? Right? But I trusted my manager because I knew how he works and all that. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes you need to go with your gut instincts. Obviously, you need to do your study and all that. But um, one of the reasons why I left Amazon was I was not enjoying. So my mind was telling me, stay with Amazon. That's the easy part. My heart was telling me, why the hell you want to die there every day? Just make a move. So always in life, when you have to make those crucial decisions, you'll have your mind telling you something you'll have your heart telling you something, right? And I can tell you with confidence on my heart saying, listen to your heart, not your mind, because mind is monkey. Swami is always tell, mind is a mad monkey. Don't follow your mind, follow your heart, because that will keep you happy. And today, I have a 100 member team, and uh, Tika Matrix was a $9 million ARR company. Within four years, we have taken it to $39 million. Hundred, and uh, we are now, we are, now, we are now offering internships. I've also, like, my passion was always also training people. So I looked for, I, thankfully I got connected to Simon or sir, and um, I looked for opportunities here, and I am now taking the digital marketing and then also doing the value-added course. We ran several internship programs. Uh, some of the BBA third-year students who had passed out last year, people from, uh, I think, uh, MBA passed outs as well. And then we're planning to do one more in the April, May, during the summer time. So like Kunranjan sir was saying, don't, like April, May, we wasted our time. Like back then, nobody was there to tell us. Swami was there, oh, yeah, but we were like, relax, chill. Um, now you have people who are coming and holding your hand, showing you the path and all that. So April and May, enjoy your holidays. Also learn something new. Because the biggest asset you all have, and Gunranjan sir and I don't have, is time. All of you are in early 20s. They're like late 40s. Late 40s. The biggest asset that you have is time. That's the biggest asset. Everything said and done. So the first 15 years of your professional career, don't run behind the money. Learn to acquire skills, right? And the second 15 years, you don't have to run behind the money. Money will run behind you. Money will run behind you. Trust me, this is real life experience that I've seen. So first 15 years, just focus on acquiring as many skills as possible. The best way to learn skills is don't sit in an AC room and think, hey, you'll get it done. No. Get on the road, walk the streets, do it yourself. That's when you'll learn. Like Gunanjan sir said, you have to dirty your hands. You have to jump into the fire. You have to feel the pressure. But don't take the pressure. See what is the probable solutions, feasibility of solutions, and tread your path carefully. With that, I'll end my discussion, and I'll present it to Sunil sir to talk about the interview. Just checking, working right? Sairam, uh, firstly, thank you for esteemed faculty, uh, Vince, Guranjan sir, for us for giving this opportunity. Uh, we have another 30 minutes, so I'll try and keep it super quick and um, get as uh, effective as possible. Oh, well, Guru Anjan sir said he doesn't like slides, he doesn't like pictures, <laughs> uh, but I think uh, I'll have to go with this mode. Um, so let me quickly start uh, sharing my screen. Am I 
quick introduction. Um, most of you know me, um, Sunil. Um, I have about nine years of experience. Uh, worked about five years at Amazon, uh, mostly on the advertising team. Uh, after which I joined uh, Vishwas's startup, Tikametrics. Worked there for three years, then started my own enterprise called JK Brands. Is into uh, fabrication of metal bed frames. We'll go into the details of it. Apart from that, I'm also marketing director at Nap Queen Sleep, and also trying a few other ideations uh, along with that as well. So JK Brands, um, we started the operations uh, May 2019. Currently, we have 15 member strength. The category that we deal is fabrication and powder coating. Um, so the locations, we're present in Bangalore and Hosur. And the market, or our target customer market is primarily export. Right? Uh, that is where it all started. Uh, I'll share my journey over there, but also we have started entering into local market as well. This is a quick example uh, of the bed frame. Uh, so this is actually made in India, bed frame made by us at JK Brands. Um, and uh, if you look at the product, uh, it's, it's on Amazon, sold in uh, Amazon.com, the US marketplace. Um, before I get there, maybe a little quick introduction, right? Like in, in the introduction, I told you, hey, um, I did my BBA MBA, right? I didn't do any mechanical engineering. Um, then I was on Amazon, then I went to Tikometrics and blah, blah, blah. But how did I get into bed frames? And I, I didn't know that I'll do something there. I, it was, this was something that I was definitely not even thinking about doing it. Um, but I did definitely have, um, this, I just want to quickly take you through the journey which led me there. So I always had this goal of, hey, never settle, right? Do something on your own. Hunger, that is something that will keep pushing you. So that's the same hunger that I had. And that hunger led me to quit Amazon and go to Tikametrics and then quit Tikametrics and set up this unit. So I'm going to focus on you know, like if you have any such ideas, like uh, maybe I want to share this experience in terms of how did I approach so that if you have any idea or conceptions, like um, probably you would take some uh, practices that I followed, hopefully it should work for you as well. So once I had that goal in mind, I want to do something on my own, next stage is ideation or the opportunity stage, right? So when you, the opportunity, like you'll get a lot of opportunities. You just need to keep your eyes open and see what is the right opportunity to you and you do jump on that. Like for instance, Vishwas could Amazon and then took Tikametrics. It's an opportunity. Or um, at, back at Infosys where he um, connected with his senior manager for 15 minutes, right? So opportunity doesn't come knocking your door is what people generally say, but there's a lot of opportunities, especially in India, considering how good of an economy we are, how, what is the demographic dividend that we have and all of that. The opportunity for we as Indians, it'll keep coming, right? So you need to keep your eyes open, to keep keep listening, and see what are the opportunities that you can you can take. So then, so the opportunity that I had is while I was working, uh, I got in touch with Napqueen. Napqueen, by the way, sells mattresses in US. Um, so they were not selling bed frames. Like, okay, why cannot I give them bed frames, right? I can probably start selling bed frames to them. And now, if I have to do bed frames, what do I need to do? Should I go get it manufactured from elsewhere and give it to, give it to the brand, or should I do it on my own? So I started looking at possible um, scopes of getting it manufactured elsewhere. But in India, unfortunately, that's the case. Everybody wants to keep higher margins, 100% margins. If you look at our competitive index, right? how many of you are preparing for UPSC exams? Anybody? UPSC? One? OK. Um, I was a UPSC student, um, so I, um, like, I was in Delhi for about two, three years. So when you, whenever you're studying UPSC, you also get to learn a bit of everything, right? Like from international relations to economics, the social process, um, and all of this. So, um, so then I'm like, okay, um, let me see uh, what can I do. Now the supplier is not going to give it to me at the right price, right? Napkin is not going to buy because China is... Um, you know, like they're going to do it probably uh, at 40, 50 percent of the cost that I'm getting right now. So I said, okay, uh, do you think I can manufacture this here in India? Uh, let me do my research, right? So then that is when I started getting into the research part. 
went to Amazon.com, started looking at all the bed frames, what are the prices that these bed frames are retailing at, right? And I saw 100% of all the listings, there are about 2,000 listings on Amazon with, with bed frames, all of them are made in China. Every single one of them. Not made in Philippines, usually Philippines, Vietnam are good in furniture, but every single thing was made in China. Right? So then I, I understood, okay, this is how the models are, because I didn't even know what bed frame is even before this. Right? If you look at this, you would probably like, okay, what is this? Because we in India use mostly wooden cards and all of that, right? Like, uh, so I got introduced to this idea, started digging a little bit. Then what I also did is, while I was doing it, I found out who's a brand which is selling most number of bed frames, right? Then I came across a South Korean company, which is called as Dinners. By the way, this is now acquired by a company uh, you, you, you're all familiar with, Hyundai, right? So Hyundai actually acquired this company. So Zinus is a publicly listed company in South Korea. So all of their financials are available. So I went to LinkedIn pages, Zinus South Korea page, started looking at, hey, can I get this company's earnings? And I want to see how much, how many bed frames are really being sold. I'm going to open the financial statement right here. Right? The one that you see is Korean won on the top because what I got is for every single quarter, I, I started getting this PDF files. which talks about Zinus's revenue stream, how much are they making, which marketplace, and so forth. So these numbers are a little mind-boggling. It's not that USD numbers are not, but let me focus on the conversions here. So you're looking at every quarter from 21 to 2022, what's the change? Likewise, right? So if you look at this, every single quarter, they do about $220 million. <laughs> That's one million is eight crores. So 220 into eight crores, right? So um, 220,000. So that is, that is how much they make in terms of revenue, right? So then, okay, this got me interesting. If one brand is selling about 220 million every single quarter on amazon.com, and what about all the other brands put together? Is there an opportunity for me to kind of look into it, right? So then went further into my research, but before I do that, I want to say to you that Zinners also sells mattresses, right? The revenue that we are looking at here is mattresses plus bed frames put together. And then, okay, let me look at revenue by product. Then I broke down, all, uh, all of this information is publicly available, right? So then I broke down, I'm like, okay, uh, revenue by mattresses is so much, bedroom furniture, bedroom furniture is ideally your bed frames, right? Then I'm like, okay, there we go. 37% of 220 million, that's an average, is still good. The sizable uh, brand right there. I'm like, okay then, which is the region that they sell the most in, right? This is, by the way, the financial statement of a company. So then I'm like, okay, USA may comprises about 90%. So I was looking at selling it to Nap Queen, which is selling in US. They have mattresses, they don't have bed frames, right? And um, so I spoke to the um, CEO of the company. I said, hey, I want to supply bed frames to you. Right? I was in, I was in a good rapport with him and he encouraged, okay, like if you can send me a sample, great. This is all I had at that point of time, right? So I have a prospective customer Right? But I, have, I don't have anything else, I just have idea, right? So then I'm like, okay, now how do I get this? Because no mechanical engineering background, only marketing sales, how would I make a bed frame? So then I hired, um, I, I, I got a welder uh, just uh, in front of my home, um, within the compound walls. I um, you know, like got, the, got the designs, um, you know, do, if you do your research, you'll get all the bed frame. Nothing uh, sky fi in terms of the design, very normal basic design. So the local welder started welding it, and then I started understanding what are the challenges. Simple product, yeah, but you need everything should fit, right? There should not be any noise and all of that. So then um, we, we were able to do, uh, let's say, a product which is close to 60% uh, to what was expected, um, but we, we still finished that sample. Um, st I started doing sample testing, put my mattresses, started jumping around it, and quick, 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 you know, there's a sound which, which, which started coming out. Like, okay, I need to figure out how do I do this better. I started approaching industry, um, industry leaders uh, or anybody who has know-how, uh, how do we do it? 
um, everybody costs a bomb. Like, you know what is tooling in mechanical engineering? So for a, any single component, you want to get the same exact size or dimensions, you need to get into tools, right? Like where there's a press machine, you make a die cast, and then you put in the metal and, the, and there's a punch which happens by, by big machines. And that is how you generate the component. So because the component that I wanted to use, I needed the same component every single time, right? So if I have to do it by hand, then it's going to be tough. Uh, like every single mm counts. So I cannot do a component which is 20 mm and the next component at 19 mm, it doesn't work. The other part, it, it, it's just your Lego bricks. You now, if you're familiar with Lego, it, it fits, right? That is how the bed frame had to be. So then, um, yeah, like so it worked out. Uh, we, we somehow uh, found all of these pieces together, put it aside, send him a sample. Um, he, he gets the sample and he's like, okay, um, he gave me a target price. I didn't know if I can make that target price. I just wanted to get that order, try and do it on my own. So Gaudia order, the target price was about, um, let's say about $40 or $35 average because of different sizes. I'm like, okay, now I have order for one container because they deal with containers. I didn't know what a container size is. And if anybody of you have seen a container, it's about 40 feet in terms of the length. Um, so then I'm like, okay, one container order, great. Now I need people to make, uh, firstly, I wanted to know how many bedrooms will fit in a container. Then I, there's a software online called crates.com. Went there, put some dimensions. It told me that I can put about 1,300 to 1,400 units per container. Right, I did one with a sample. Now let's do 1,300, 1,400. Um, what next? I needed um, people, I needed place, I needed steel, funding, and all of that. So I, I'll try to give it as uh, brief as possible, given the time constraint, but then we started, um, I, I went to Hosur, right? Hosur is where a lot of people, uh, industrial layout and so forth. We actually, like, um, I found some of my team members, we were holding play cards saying that, hey, I need welders. Like, if, if you're a welder, uh, I, I would need you to come, come with me. Um, that's because in Bangalore, I couldn't find any welders, right? Any welders that came to Bangalore, he's like, okay, where is your setup? You don't have a setup, you will not, you will not give me a job, right? They're looking at stability. So I had to do this, find people. Every single person that I speak to is a welder. But I tell him, hey boss, like, I have a, I'm trying to set up a factory. Can you, do you think you can help me and stuff? So I had to go through that grind, right? With, on the highway, trying to hire people. Um, so we, luckily we found one, you know, a couple of people uh, from there, then found a place as well, which is 5,000 square feet. Um, I think most of you, the third year students at least, visited uh, the place. Right, so when I got the place, I thought, okay, um, it's a pretty big place. Do I need it or no? But I'm like, okay, uh, no more time because I have a deadline to meet. I need to get the production going. And then the challenge comes with steel, right? These are the raw materials that goes into bed frame. You have steel, labor, powder coating, wood, and packaging. And I must say, before I started doing this, being a UPSC student, I knew steel, India produces the second largest, right? So I knew, okay, steel though, I can find it in India, not a problem. But then what I didn't realize is, this is China versus India, what is the output per year by million metric tons? If you look at this output, China is, what? They're doing about 1,000 million metric tons every single year. What is India doing 2023? Probably around, let's say, 200, right? So where am I going here is, the price of steel in India was about, in 2019, right, 42 rupees per kilo, just before COVID. Right? So after that, if you look at steel price, it is 79 per kilo. Right? That's a big jump. And that's because, you want to take a guess? Why, why did steel prices jump? Economics, what is the basic tenets of economics? Not production. The basic tenets of economics. Yeah, I heard that, right? Demand and supply. The supply in India is limited. The demand is more. That's why the price is going up, especially this happened after COVID, right? 
So, um, and that is where the steel prices were at the top and the $35 that I got as a target price, I had to say buy to it. Um, because in India, how it works is, um, like you have the manufacturer, then you have a distributor, then you have a markup, and then they sell it at it, right? So if I, if I had to make it at $35, I had to get steel at probably 60 rupees per kilo. I connected with a lot of big brands, big brands such as Tata Steel, Jindal, and all of them, and they're like, hey, you want steel from us? Minimum order quantity is 500 tons. How many tons do I need? I would probably need 20 tons to make 1,400 units of bed frame that will fit into a container. Okay, so 10 times. So that is where um, it didn't work out. So then I paid it. I paid at 70 rupees, right? I paid 70 rupees, got the steel, um, then started finding people. A lot of issues. Had to find distributors. Uh, when I say distributors, the vendors actually who can you know, make those parts and all of that. Every single part, there's rubber bushes, powder coating, um, you know, the, you need machinery and equipment. Um, I need to learn myself how to do welding, right? I, which welding machine to use. Is it a TIG machine? Is it a MIG machine? Or is it an arc welding, right? Like which gas should I use? Is it a carbon dioxide or is it an argon or is it a combination of both? So the learning process Right, like all of this while I was at Decometrics, by the way. Right? So <laughs> I was I was going to market during the first half of the day, right? Trying and doing all this research, coming back, and thankfully COVID helped me do this. Right, taking advantage of the opportunity that you have. If if it was go to office, I don't think I would have accomplished this. Right. So then, um, so come back, log into work, and work was not easy. Right, because. We, which was as a manager, he'll, he'll get things done, right? And you need to be at top notch in terms of delivery and performance. So, uh, and I was managing a team of 25 people uh, at Ecometrics as well, so it was not easy. Um, yeah, so when all of these challenges, but what kept me going through these challenges, right? The goal, right? Going back to the slide, the goal, the idea, and the opportunity. Hey, it's in India. Like, if you're a UPSC student, you'll be like, Make in India. I don't know if you recall, there was a period where um, we, we wanted to um, India-China war, right? In India, the sentiment was, hey, we want to stop using Chinese brands. That you cannot stop. The <laughs> import from China is growing rapidly. We have a $100 billion trade deficit with them. So th but that sentiment was so high, and there was posts on China which says, hey, I, we want to do the same thing with Indian products, but I cannot find any made in India product here, right? And then I still remember there's a, a tweet by Anand Mahindra which says, like, I, I wish I could have got that tweet screenshot, uh, but he says, he put that Chinese tweet and he's like, guys, we need to back up, like, you know, get our act right and start delivering get made in India products out. Right, so that is the passion also that I had, a little bit of patriotism that, hey, we need to get Make in India products out there. And before doing this, <laughs> so before doing this, I was also um, trying to sell on Amazon, right? So this is not something which started in 2019. Even before that, that hunger of restlessness of, like, I don't want to be comfortable. I want to keep doing something. So um, I was selling, um, and yeah, like I've, I, I listed my account on Amazon.com.co.uk, German, France, and all of that, because it's very easy to do, thanks to Jeff Bezos. I used to sell Wix from here. You know, like Parker refills, I have sent them from here, right? So I, I used to buy, I used to list these products on Amazon, I used to get orders, I used to go buy them, put it in India Post, send it from here, right? Because if, if a Parker refill over here was about 100 rupees, on Amazon, .co.uk, it was selling it for, let's say, four, five, six pounds, right? Probably 600 rupees. Um, so, and, and India Post was pretty good at that point of time. They were probably taking me, taking from me about uh, 100, 200 rupees as a delivery logistics cost. But then I also started getting into something called as Moscow Mule Mugs. It's a copper mug. Um, if, if you're familiar with Marudabad in Uttar Pradesh, you find a lot of these copper uh, utensils. 
So I started selling them and I took a hit over there uh, because things started scaling up so fast, big players started entering and I was not a manufacturer, I was a distributor, I got squished. So all of those thoughts or the experiences that I had, like it kind of gave me that conviction that I need to manufacture something, right? And, and I need to make it in India. Because I had the opportunity here, I had a one container order. Now I, I went through the, you know, like the hustle of finding people, finding team. Uh, I need to thank my team, I, they'll get onto the call very soon, but I need to thank my team too, uh, because without a good team, it's not possible with whatever you're trying to accomplish, right? So one um, guy, one request or one recommendation is please try to find a mentor as soon as possible in your career. Men like that, they are gonna save you a lot of years and a lot of money as well, right? You need to find a mentor as soon as possible. Try and see who can, your, who can be your mentor and you need to get hang of them because that is what I did, right? Um, I found somebody who can support me and help me through this process and expedite the learning. So, so saw the goal, idea, opportunity, done, risk. I considered the risk, okay, I'm still not going to make it at $35. It's gonna be $40, $45, it's fine. I wanna deliver that container, right? So the container initially I thought was, okay, it'll take me two months. It took me four to five months to deliver the container, right? So. Then, yeah, like the challenges and all of that we can talk through. But the second and the third and the fourth container, the first container took four months, second container took three months, third container took two months, and now I can confidently deliver one container for every single month, right? So that's about 1,400 units of bed frames every single month. And so how, how did that happen? Because of the open-mindedness for learning, right, and the optimization during the learning process and also innovating. Uh, some of you folks who visited, I don't know if you recall, um, we had, you know this glucose drip when you're in hospital beds, right? So we have a drilling machine, by the way, right? So for drilling machine, there's a drill bit and there's a metal. So without lubricant, what will happen? There's a friction, so there's heat, right? So because of the friction and heat, the drill bit will get damaged, right? So you had to get a machine which will keep putting lubricant, right, every single time. I could not afford that machine, so I got some machine which is about 40,000 rupees. That machine was about 2 lakh, 2 lakh 50,000, just for that lubricant. So what we did is we uh, had this glucose uh, pipes, right, from uh, gravity. Just put this uh, lubricant on the higher side. Uh, we adjusted what's the flow, right, and, and it started dripping. So we just saved 2 lakhs right there, you know, just using that simple mechanism. Um, so, I, I think the applause should go to, go to my team, but uh, you know, the innovation can, like Jugaad way of doing things in India, right? Like, you need to be really open-minded and try and appreciate all the Jugaad things that we do. Yes, we are so disorganized on the roads, right? But still there is, you know, some, some uh, form of truth in terms of in that uh, disorganization. But yeah, so innovation, implementation, and patience. Um, these, I would say, is, has been uh, my tenets for success in my entrepreneurship journey. Right? Let me just quickly go back to macro factors. Now, other things that helped me in this journey, and you as an entrepreneur, you know how much ever you kind of try and put in your effort, there are certain factors that you should be well aware of. If you're not aware of it and don't take advantage of it, you, may, you know, it may not work for you, right? There's so many macro factors that worked uh, in, my, um, in my case, uh, I want to quickly touch base on that. And before I get there, research. Research is very, very, very important, right? There is how much ever time and effort you put in your research, there's no end to it, right? Research over here is having open-minded and always learning because all of this you will not find on the internet. You need to at times start speaking to people. Like you, need to, you need to keep speaking to people and only then you'll get exposed to a lot of, lot of this information. Um, so research, when it is taught in school, sometimes you know, I, was, I did my MBA um, and a lot of this probably just you know, passed through um, uh, from one year to another. But during my 
journey, like uh, along with this JK brands, um, I'm also trying to work on two different ideas. And trust me, like some of these researchers, if you're not doing it, you are going to burn time, money as well, right? Um, so riches is super key, and I'm really looking forward to um, the session after this you know, in terms of um, how, how you're going to pitch your ideas and so forth. But the macro factors that really work is political economic scenario, right? The tension between China and US, it, it's, it's going on. When Trump was there, he was putting trade, trade tariffs on made in China products, right? So anything that you want to get from China to US is a 20% tariff. So India, at this point of time, it's zero, right? So I can send any products from India to US at zero percent, at least the metal bed frames. So the cost of $35 was not able to meet $45, right? That was where I was. So it was a $10 difference. And this, no duties, right? No import duties in US kind of helped me cushion those costs. Government policies, you need to understand because government is the largest, right? Social, social organization, right? So. This is while, because if you look at me as an entrepreneur, okay, I have 15, 15 people. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not to a stage where I'm paying any CSR, but then this is the sheer joy of employing people. This is like, you need to believe in the power of giving, right? The, the more you give, the more you get. Trust me on this. Like I've, I've tested it out. The more you give, the more you get. That is because when you, when you give, I think you'll be in, in that psychology to do a lot more, right? I think that'll give you a lot more confidence. Um, so when somebody says you need to give, that's because there is something that you will get back in return. So then uh, export incentives. So we also have something called as export incentives, anything that you send from India, Indian government wants to uh, incentivize exporters. So let's say a container cost me about 40 to 50 lakhs, right? to send from here, that's the value of the container. You get about 10, um, not 10 percent, sorry, 1 percent of that uh, as a duty drawback, let's say 50,000 rupees, right? So this also helped me cushion the cost. No GST for exports, right? So if I'm buying any steel today, I'm paying tax on it. But if I prove to the government that I've not used it locally, but I've actually exported that steel, I also get those rebates of steel, right? Whatever tax that I've paid, I would get it back, right? So that also helped me cushion that cost and meet that target of $35, right? And having said all of that, there are a lot of challenges, um, right, which, which we probably cannot go through uh, in every single one of them. But one major challenge when it comes to export containers, the containers from Bangalore, they travel to Whitefield. Whitefield, there's a place called as Concord, um, Bangalore has a port, by the way, it's a dry port. If uh, you get an opportunity, you don't actually go. Because if you go to the, I mean, if, if you see pictures of the dry port, you think you're in Mumbai or somewhere, right? Because you will not see any of these uh, buildings in Bangalore. Um, so from here to Whitefield, I need to pay 12 to 15,000 for the transport, right? From Kormangla to Whitefield. If you're familiar with Bangalore, that's about 20 kilometers. And then from Whitefield, It'll get onto a train, and from train it'll go to Chennai, and from Chennai it'll start going to Colombo, and then the route takes in. So where I'm coming at is the current transportation cost of a container is super high compared to China or any other developed country. So that's where the government is coming up with something called as dedicated freight corridors, where they're able to connect dry or inland ports to coastal ports. Right. This is this is a project um, I think should be completed very soon. Uh, and also, one of the challenges that I faced with my recent shipment, um, you know, going back to the risk mitigation, during COVID times, what happened? Online marketplace boom, right? Everybody started purchasing online, right? Before COVID, one shipment costed, if I had to ship one container from point A to point B, let's say from India to US, it costed me about $2,000. During COVID, it costed about $10,000, right? That's a five times increase because there's so much demand for containers. 
So I face something similar. If, if you've been following what's happening in Gaza and Israel, right? And you know the Suez Canal route, most of the ships go through that. So today there are some rebels, called as Houthi rebels, right? Close to Lebanon, where they're blocking those shipments. Right? So m my customer is saying, hey, send me the shipment, but all the shipments are being attacked and the container price is 2000 and it's constantly on the rise, right? So which means if you're a business, if, if you're getting into entrepreneurial journey, likewise, right? Not everything is in your control. You need to be prepared to, you know, to handle situations uh, as and when it comes through. So that is when we started routing the shipments to Korea now, right? It's more expensive, but then we can save time and risk. Just want to give you that quick snippet. But still, even all of this support, the cost of manufacturing in India is still 1.5 times more than China, right? That's because of the steel, where the Chinese produce a lot of steel. They produce so much, they're just exporting, like it's more bene easier for me if I just get the steel from China and fabricate it here and send it. So this is a challenge that will continue to be there. So because while we are sending out shipments, it has also helped me to kind of manufacture my products for local markets as well. So I've expanded my catalog. These are some of the products that are there from JK Brands. And these are some other items um, that we have now expanded to. Right? So today our focus is to come up with a private label brand and you know, make this Zinus of India. That's where my thoughts are. Because Zinus is focused on giving affordable furnitures and, and I think that is what we are currently doing, right? All of these other products, uh, we are going to launch them. So which means I'm again looking at another opportunity. I have, the, I have a manufacturing unit. I'm already doing it. How do I expand my market or reach to other products? This is, we have, we have completed about five uh, containers. That's about 8,000 plus bed frames. So you can, you can say that there's about 8,000 families in US uh, you know, who are sleeping on Made in India bed frames at this point, right? So, yeah. we'll do a quick, we'll do a quick um, call, wherein we can, uh, you know, show your virtual tour of the bed frame uh, office so that you can start seeing um, the process. It will probably take five minutes. Uh, feel free to ask me if you have any questions. Let's make use of uh, our time. Any questions at all?
ਪੈਣ ਹੀ ਐਂਡ ਇਟ ਵਿਦ if you can hear me by the way prasad you might want to come on camera and say a quick hi because many people will recognize you the, the fan following you yeah so i don't know if you can see all right uh, you might want to walk through how um you know like we are manufacturing bed frame from start to finish um can you try speaking once hold on no hold on hold on can you hear me yeah go for it yeah Hello can you hear me Yes yes we can hear you yes. Okay so this is the stock if we get it from the market we receive it as bundles like this we are on 20 to 20 to 12 bundles depending on the sizes These are all uh, CRFH pipes it's of different uh, profiles like 20 by 40 12 by 25 or 19 by 19 So this uh, the most the most uh, used size in our uh, factory is 20 by 40, 12 by 25, or 19 by 19. Prasad, hold on. No? And uh, we take the design. Prasad, hold on. Yeah. So the pipes that we see here, uh, this is called yeah, yeah. CRFH pipes, right? Um, CR over here stands for cold cold rolled. right so what is cold rolled um so when if i'm sure you have seen there's big steel coils yeah so these steel coils are cut in and then they put into big rolling machines it goes like this you know in a flat steel sheet and then it starts getting getting bent and they form a circle first and once they form a circle and this circle is sent through a tool and that tool will have a square or whatever dimensions that we have so we use different dimensions we use 12 by 25 20 by 40 19 by 19 and each of these come with different thickness some come at 0.8 mm come some 0.6 mm some is at 1 mm so why are we using different grades of steel is because if you look at uh, automobile right how if if you look if you study automobile structure wherever it is weak right wherever the structure is weak they use a stronger steel right so same principle we use different thicknesses of pipes to make the bed frame strong i can use 1.2 everywhere but can i meet the 35 dollars no so it's a price plus strength and today i can tell you probably each one of our bed frames can easily bear about 400 to 500 kilos no problem right a small sing single size if you go to a full or a queen size then that would probably go to 800 kilos 
So even with that 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1 mm thickness, we're able to optimize which steel goes to which part of the bed frame, right? That way, you're able to keep the cost low while also provide stability. Go ahead, Prasad. Yeah. So uh, as we receive uh, this, these pipes on the market, we are making different size of bed frames, like queen, queen and king sizes. According to that, we take the dimension and we cut it using the uh, bandsaw machine. Yeah. So here you can see it's taking the measurement of one particular size. Just hold on, yeah. So the machine that you see here is called as bandsaw. I didn't know what bandsaw is. So we actually got a cutoff machine. Do you? Uh, I'm sure you guys would have seen a cutoff machine, like that. You know, like any local welder, he'll have uh, one blade which runs and he cuts it, right? So that's the machine that we actually started using first, right? Um, but with that machine, you can cut two lengths, five lengths, twenty lengths. But here we want to cut about two thousand, three thousand lengths of pipes, right? So which means over a period of time, the cutoff machine started vibrating because of which we used to get about one mm to two mm difference for every single cut. So that was not going to work. So as part of this learning and exp you know, experimenting um, uh, process, I actually went to Coimbatore. Uh, somebody told me, hey, go to Coimbatore, you'll, you'll, you'll learn. Um, so I went to Coimbatore, and in Coimbatore, I saw some of these machines, which is called as bandsaw machine, and they, their only action is to cut. Right, there's multi-dimensional and all of that, but we have just one dimension, which is just cut straight, cut through straight. Yeah, go ahead. Prasad, go ahead. Yeah. So this is the cutoff machine yeah. you are talking about. Yeah. Okay. So I'll show you how the cutting happens in a bank. So, so if, if you visit, a lot of that you see is jugard. Um, so for example, we are looking at, hey, now what's the length of the pipe that we need to cut? Every time we cannot be measuring. So what we have done is through that length, we have just measured and put that, uh, uh, you want to show that fixture where we, yeah. You, you see those? Stoppers. Yeah, stoppers right there. So for every single measurement, we just start moving this from, Every, uh, you know, to different places, we just keep the pipe cut according to that. And, and by the way, can you show the pipe feeding? Where is the pipe? It's feeding? already cut. Yeah. So you see the pipe is being fed from the other side. So it's pipe not, is fed from here. Yeah. So the pipe is being fed from the other side. There is there's a stopper there. It goes and stops whatever measurements we need. And then there's a cutting operation which happens. This is, this is used to hold that, uh, these jars are holding the pipes and that is the, pre and the blade which runs in a circular yeah. That's why it is, it will be like a band that means it is called a band saw. Yeah. So the, blade, the, the blade that you see is, is through, run through two different wheels and, and there's a learning there as well. So like some of these blades that you get could be Chinese made blades which just cut off. Right, so then we found, okay, there's a brand called Amada, which is a Japanese brand, very cost effective, but for probably for one container, we may do about 50, 60,000 cuts of steel, right? So we just use one blade for the entire container, right? Just identifying the right set of tools uh, makes the job easier. Yeah. All right. Can you go to the next operation? So after the cutting, after the cutting has been done, you can see the bud here. So these are having a sharp edges here. You can see. So we need to level it and then goes to the next process. So before going to the next process, it's called the buffing process. Here, I'll show you how it is. Okay, thanks to Zoom, we are not able, to, we are not hearing any of those loud noises. Yeah, so every cut, it's not sharp. I mean, when I say it's not sharp, there's a little bit of blur that comes from the cutting operation. So then that's grind it off. That's important because if you don't grind it off, it won't set 
in your fixtures, right? We have fixtures. Can you show fixtures, please? Yes. Can I connect to the fixtures? Right. So if I had a button, it won't, it won't button properly. So which means I'll be off by a 1 mm or 0.5 mm. That was going to impact the entire fit and finish of the product. Right. So it's important that we even bud it completely. So, so these are, uh, this is the part B of our bit tray where we use uh, this this picture is used to weld these can, can you do a, can you do proper a, seat can you do a welding operation uniform distance yes yes so here we use a make welding machine and we use the auto cylinder and our operator will show go, you go 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 man go what you and you can see he is putting the component. These are all the pressed components, which is, which is outsourced. Yeah. So this is what I was referring to, you know, they're, they're butting those U's, right? Small metal components, which means uh, we probably use about one lakh components of, of that in one, one uh, container. And every single one of them has to be in the same order, same measurement. If not, it, it would not fit, right? You, you cannot fix the bed frame. So any smoke that is emanating from that, we have, can you show the exhaust fans? So we, we have these, yeah. this funnel system, all the three, um, this funnel system so that the safety of people who work there is also taken care of. So today, if you notice, a lot of these companies are getting out of China. Have you read the news? Yeah. And it's a big advantage for India because industrial jobs or the labor cost in China is expensive, right? It is, it's, the Chinese economy is growing and the labor cost is also increasing, right? While India's labor cost is at a competitive advantage. While yes, our steel is on the expensive side, but the labor in India is relatively affordable compared to China. That will also help us meet these target prices. Can you go to the next operation? Yeah. This would be the uh, in part after it, yeah, it's made it. Yeah. I'll just show you how these A frames are being rendered. You see this? So, so this is the part. Yeah, the parts get cut. And to and be they... precise, we use the <laughs> Go on, sir. Yeah, the parts get cut. They get those parts put into this fixture, right? Again, all of this fixture, if you go to an industry, they're going to probably charge you about four or five lakhs to make one fixture, right? Like, because that's the code I've got it. Like here, it's all again Jugad way of doing things. Like we probably did this fixture at about 10,000 rupees, right? Yeah. Can you go to the... So when we go to a mass production and uh, when you are, when you are... Can you do a drilling operation? Yes. So, the, so yeah. this is again a jig sample. Can, so can this is again a jig used to uh, for the corner drills. So the pipe gets arrested here. Okay. So that all the pieces are same. Like it should be uniform. 
And since it's a mass production, we have to use the genes. We can't keep marking again and again. So we will use it like this, so that you get two holes in one type uniform. So for every single component, there's fixtures in place. Right? It's not a manual. While most of it is still manual, somebody has to do it. But there are fixtures in place so that every single component that is cut, that is fixed or welded, is same as let's say one to a tenth to a hundredth to a thousandth bed frame. Everything is going to be uniform. Can you can you show the um, the drip um, from the coolant? So this is this is the cooling tank from Jugad here also. Yeah. Your video is. Since the drill bits get heated, so we use is, the cooling. Yeah. So this is what I was telling you, right? Um, <laughs> the glucose or whatever you call that. So we just fix it there. It comes from a higher level, and then it starts dripping so that the, the bit lasts for a longer time. So it's a basic drilling machine which costs about 50,000. If I need to get one without the uh, you know automatic coolant, then it's going to cost me about 2,50,000. Cool. That, that's good, Prasad. Yeah. So each of these parts get. I'll just welded. show you the assembly of how all these parts. Yeah. Uh, if you have one, yeah. If you have one ready. And, and if you want to show the chairs also after this. Yeah, yeah. I'll just show you the assembly part, how it is done. So this, so this is the A-frame I was talking about. Yeah. Like, the bed you frame, gone. Bed frame is big, right? It's humongous. It's big. Right? How do you ship it? So if you look at the box of the bed frame, you'll be surprised. Maybe, Prasad, you can also show the box later. If you... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll finish with this and then. No, no. Let let the them f let them fix it. Just in show, box. Show the box. Yeah. By then they would have fixed it. Okay. Okay. So this is the box, which we have to inside it. Yeah. So that's the box of the bed frame, right? Everything is do-it-yourself kit. All the components get into the box. So when you actually get it home, it's a small box. You take all the components out and make a bed for yourself. Good. Can you show the tables and chair as well, the, the new designs? Yes, those are new designs. Just open the chair, right? Open the chair and... Uh... Open. So we have we have started expanding this right like all of this is metal so just attach a wood because you don't have to set up a new manufacturing process altogether so we optimizing and expanding like yeah we have a table ready right here right again do you have a table box which is uh no sir currently you have the chair? We do have a folding table box. Can you, can you show the chair? We have a folding table. Yes, folding chair. So this is the chair, very compact and yeah. you can carry it. Yeah. Can you can you open it? You see yeah. this? It's just straight. It doesn't look like a chair. There we go. No, just place it on the ground and sit on it, no? Yeah, that's the chair. Right. So and it's all affordable mm -hmm. products, right? That's the concept. Uh, of how we can make um, more of these items. Yeah.
Well, can you show the bed frame? You can again fold it back and just. Yeah, bed frame is getting. Uh, right. So this is a single cot. So we, have, how it is. we have different sizes. Um, twin, twin is a single, full queen and king sizes. Right. All of these sizes have the almost almost similar boxes. Right. So each of these this box gets into a container. So about thousand. 200 to 1,500 boxes in a container. Cool. So we are also selling this on Amazon, by the way, Amazon India. Uh, we are selling these um, bed frames. Uh, you cannot use your regular coir mattresses or your cotton uh, filled mattresses. Uh, but you you can use your foam mattresses on this. This is meant only for foam mattresses. Because if you use your coir mattresses, you see those gaps in between, it'll sink in. Right? And you'll start feeling the steel. But again, it's cost effective. Where if you are moving from one place to another, you don't think about hassle of not moving the bed out of your room. Just open it. You're in you're in tenth floor in a backwood. Right? Just just take it in your lift and fix it. So do do it yourself, bed frames. Cool. Thanks, Prasad. You have a nap queen box. Which Thank is you, ready. sir. You have a nap queen box which is ready. He might. In uh, Zeta, I will. Yeah. Can you can you Zeta the, Zeta? Can you show the Zeta model? Yeah. So we have different sets of models. Uh, this one is Alpha. Yeah. Uh, your video is your video is frozen. One second. Yeah. No, no. Do you have a pack box? Or if you have a nap queen packed box? Yeah, pack box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so th these are boxes which are ready. The inventory uh, to ship it. Can you show the made in India logo wow. there? The box. Can you just take the box out? So this is another model. Um, the model that you saw, here, the box was much bigger. This one is lengthier, but it, it, it is probably about three, three by three inches, or four by four inches max. Right? That's how narrow the box is, and you can actually build your bed frames out of that. And the reason why we made this box is to optimize space in container. Right? The more you know, compact the box is, the more boxes you can load into the container, right? The more boxes you load into the container, your shipping cost, yeah. your, your, your shipping cost is going to come down the more boxes you send, right? So that's one, one more way, you know, how do you, I mean, this is all about innovation, right? Like, this is innovation in practice, innovation in practice uh, in, in, in industries, in streets, and all of that. Cool. Thanks, Prasad. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. so we fabricate um, the bed frames here, after which, after which we take them to um, powder coating units uh, in Hosur, and um, this is this is a images from there. So each of these steel gets, uh, you know, there's there's oil on the steel, right? Uh, if you have touched steel, there's oil. Why is there oil on steel? Yeah, it should not get rusted, right? So then what's the process? We need to powder coat, right? The steel has to be powder coated, the black color, that's powder coat. So what we do is we take the steel out, put it in different process where we do desilting, we remove the oil, and, and w once all of that is done, we kind of put it into these hangers that you see. These are conveyor belts, right? So you start hanging them. It'll get into an oven. It'll heat. Uh, sorry, before that, they try and spray the metal, right? And once the metal is sprayed, then you can actually see this here, right? It's being hung up like this. Then the, the spraying booth is right here behind and they spray it after which it goes to an oven and the finished product comes out right so then we pack it right here this 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 is by the way in hosur about 50 kilometers from bangalore and then the container comes here and we load the container right so that's how our operations are done 
um, for for the metal bed frames. Any questions? If You, you can reach out to me, like uh, I think most of you are already there on LinkedIn. Um, but I want to take this opportunity if you don't have any questions, um, you know, like your summer, right? Guru Ranjan sir was saying, what do you do in, during your summer times? Uh, while you also uh, go to uh, his place and, you know, take up the social causes. Um, we, I would also want to give you an opportunity for summer internship. Um, so the... So the idea um, that um, like we've been tinkering on, uh, Vishwas, uh, myself, and uh, our guru, like uh, Mr. Srinivas Gudanti. Uh, so we're working on a company called Streetly. Uh, it's actually available on mobile application. Um, so what we are looking for is we are looking for some uh, for a business uh, development executive, um, and the location is in Bangalore. Like uh, I don't know what you are planning during your summer times. But uh, this is pretty flexible. Uh, it would, you probably need to give about four to five hours in a day, um, right? So which, but I'll tell you about the job description. Um, you're expected to, I don't know if you're, are you learning any marketing or uh, skills within your courses? Yes? Yeah, yeah. So this is an opportunity for you to, you know, like practically experience uh, and learn how do you market and pitch and sell your product. Uh, with, with the store owners uh, in Commercial Street. Uh, have you seen Commercial Street in Bangalore? You're familiar with it, right? So today we have close to about 720 stores registered on our platform, and we want to do much more there. So that is where uh, we have this internship open. Um, right? Like you can reach out to me. Um, I can give you my mobile number right here. If you want to take a note, have a quick note, and you can also reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn as well. Yeah. But if you have any questions, I think somebody has a question. Yeah. Um, sir, so I have a question. Like, uh, you make bed, bed frames, and it's not like that other company doesn't make it. So how does your bed frame make different from uh, it's different from the other bed frames? Yeah. Apart from the soft uh, like noise without noise, how it is different, sir? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I, uh, if you recall, uh, during my research, there are about two thousand bed frames on Amazon.com, and all of these bed frames are from where? China, right? In India. To the best of my knowledge, people do manufacture, they make it at a very limited quantity because the bed frame, until and unless you saw it here, you probably wouldn't have thought about it, bed frame in the style, right? So not many people are making it in India, but I think they should because like today I am one person who is making it in India and selling it on Amazon.com. Maybe there should be 10 more, 20 more, 50 more, 100 more, whatever, right? So, but, but this as a product is pretty new in India. And not many of them are actually making product, but I think it'll it'll start um, uh, getting exposed to the uh, other manufacturers. I'm sure. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Hi, Ram. So, so can you tell us more about the Streetly initiative which you have taken? Yeah. So Streetly uh, is a O two O. Checking. It's, it's a O2O platform. Uh, when you say O2O, it's online to offline, right? Everything is going online, right? We're taking a different approach, different route here, where you will discover products online, right? When I say discover products online, discover products online around your location. You can set distance. Um, hey, I want to see products around me a kilometer, two kilometer, three kilometer, which is hyper local. Right? So we want to bring visibility to local stores. Um, you know, these are not the branded stores, but regular mom and pop stores, right? Non-branded stores, we are building marketing tools to them. We are bringing more visibility to those stores, to a shopper, so that they can identify or discover products online, walk to the store, 
and purchase those products, right? For example, today, if you want to find whiteboard around me, you where would you go? You would probably go to Google, and you don't know if the product is there or no, you, uh, you don't know what is the store and so forth, but we give a lot more visibility. Uh, we do a deeper discoverability of a store and a product. So today, we're doing an exercise in Commercial Street where we have about 720 stores registered, and these are all apparel stores, right? Apparels is a set of category where you want to go shop in person, offline, you want to feel the product, you want to, right? You want to touch the product. So that is where we have started with apparel, um, but this is from online to offline mode, discover online, shop offline. You might want to download the application and test it. Right, I will just take one last question. I think we are running out of uh, time. Saram sir. Hi, Ram. Sir, I have this question like, how to keep that fire on? Like, in you are going ahead to research on it because a lot of time it happens. We start working on it, but something happens, we come back from it. Yeah. So how to keep it on, like how to keep that fire on? Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's simple, right? Like um, if you're hungry, what would you do, right? Like if, if you have that hunger in you, you'll probably miss a meal, a second meal, third meal, I don't know how many days you'll fast, but you will find food, right? So it's, it's just the same, like how, important it is, is it for you, right? If, if you can put in your mind, apply your mind, um, consistency is important. Yeah, it is easier said than done, um, but I would just say that how passionate or hunger you are um, to go and get it done, that is all it is. It, it has to come, you know, like you, nobody can uh, force it on you, it has to come from within. All right, thanks a lot. I look forward to your sessions. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Sunil because he actually had been to the US, returned three days back. He has not had sleep for the last three nights because of the time zone differences. He slept at six, got up at nine in the night, and he's been awake the entire night. And I called him up in the morning. He said, I'm coming with you. So, and, and like, he doesn't get anything out of this. He's just getting interaction. He's meeting new people and um, sharing his experiences. So thank you, Sunil, for taking time out. And thank you. And I feel uh, I just uh, wish you all good luck. And uh, I feel the session was enlightening. And even if there is, if his session or my session or Good Ranjan Sir's session has lit up fire in one person here, I think we have accomplished our goal. So wish you all the good luck and uh, happy to stay in touch. Thank you. Sign. About fire, this question about what do you do when you're stuck? as an entrepreneur. Listening to Sunil, if you recognize, he's not just doing one thing, right? He's working on more than one idea. So there would be a pause, a delay in accomplishing tasks in one area. You have to give it time, but you don't have to lose time. You can work on another project. I, does that help? Huh. So most people are not stuck with just one activity. You and coming to, you know, what do they do in kitchen? When you have to do more dishes, when you're cooking a feast, is there only one fire going? Some things take a long time to cook. It's cooking and then you're working on another, on another fire. So it doesn't, you, do, you work in sequence, uh, not in sequence, but parallelly on more than one thing. So even if something takes time longer to deliver, there are other side activities that you're simultaneously working, keeping yourself occupied. You're not, tied down to uh, one delay, but you're able to use your, channelize your mind energy to parallelly on something else. Uh,
that's a little bit from my end. Sir, uh, I thank both of you for the engaging talks. From learning the true meaning of innovation to the importance of loyalty, we could take away a lot of insightful points from your personal careers and journeys. We could learn how opportunity creators actually approach problems and the value of learning and getting our hands dirty. How we actually have to be resilient to make anything successful in this world. Now I now invite Gunaranjan sir to hand over our tokens of love uh, to Vishwas sir and Sunil sir. Now all of us will break for lunch and we'll uh, convene back.